All right, the time is 7.36 p.m. Um, today is Tuesday, March 11th, 2021. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members from the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Mills, you're here. There you are. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Thank you. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Reblack. Here. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, so town officials, I don't know, did were we able to get Rick back or is he still having trouble Christian, accessing? Rick Christian, I, I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. I see you now. Yeah, I had a little problem, but I think I'm all set now. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And Vincent Lee is here. Um, are there any other, um, I know Emily Sullivan is here from the Department of Planning and Community Development. I don't know if there's anyone else um, in that department here this evening. I think Jenny will be joining uh, shortly too. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Um, Karen Klein, this is Susan Chapnick, Chair of the Conservation Commission. Susan, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. Okay, um, so for uh, serving with the board, uh, Paul Haverty, are you here? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, and representing um, Beta Group, who is the consulting engineers, uh, Marty Nover. Hi, I am here. Wonderful, how are you? I'm Marty. I'm good, and with us tonight is um, Julia Stearns, um, Greg Lucas, and Bill McGrath. All for data. Great, thank you. And then appearing for the applicant, uh, Stephanie Kiefer. Good evening. Good evening, how are you? Well. Wonderful. Okay, and uh, Stephanie, who's joining you this evening? Um, this evening, we have pretty much our, our whole team. So we have John Hessian from BSC. We have Scott Thornton from Venice. We have... Um, Bob Angler from SEB, Housing Consultants, and we have Art uh, Clipthal Glenn Noyes from Oak Tree, as well as Scott Glassick from Bruce Hamilton Architecture. Perfect. All right, well, welcome all. So this opening open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, just short of a year ago. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may re meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you your screen name or another identifier. Please take care not to share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> so we're now starting uh, resuming the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. I'd like to review some ground rules uh, for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. So this evening's discussion will primarily involve the proposed draft decision released to, to the applicant and the public on Wednesday, March 10th, 2021. However, we'll begin this evening with a few procedural matters and then continue to the public comment period on the architectural and urban design aspects of the project, which was started at the February 16th, 2021 hearing. We will then proceed to the discussion regarding the draft decision. 
So the first item um, I'd like to discuss is the, the current status of the 180 day review period for holding a public hearing. Um, so per 760 CMR 5605 section three, a comprehensive public um, excuse me, a comprehensive permit public hearing shall not extend beyond 180 days from the initial public hearing except by written consent of the applicant. So the current calendar that we have, um, the one, day 180 is Monday, April 5th, 2021, which would make today day 155. And with, so basically we have very few uh, days left in the calendar where the board is available and where council is available. And so if we are to continue, the first really open date for us um, is Tuesday, March 30th, unless we would like to try to find um, some other dates. That, um, basically every other Tuesday and Thursday is out. Um, <clears throat> and that's essentially unless um, the applicant would be willing to entertain extending the review period um, to allow us to consider some dates in the beginning of April. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I, I know may. If that's an option for you guys or not. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I believe that we had um, suggested previously that um, when we were trying to find another hearing date, I think mm -hmm. this hearing actually, um, I, I, had, I had indicated that we needed to tack on an additional week that wouldn't be a problem. So I don't know if that, that helps with some of your scheduling. I think it will because we have, this quickly flips, no people waiting in the room. Uh, looking at the calendar. So if we, ha if we meet on the 30th, um, so the 30th is the, the according to uh, Google Calendar, is during Passover. Um, and I don't know if that is, <clears throat> if that is something we should consider not meeting on that date because of it being during the period of Passover. Um, and then obviously at the end of that week, um, is we get into um, the Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, et cetera. And then the following week um, would our, would Tuesday the sixth be an available date? Mill says it's okay. Paul, would you be available that day? Mr. Chairman, I am not available that day. Okay. Yeah, another hearing. I am available on the eighth. You are available the eighth. Um, <clears throat> okay. So if we could, if, if everyone's okay with us meeting on um, Tuesday, March 30th, and then if we, are un, if we are not resolved on that date, then we would move forward to Thursday, um, April 8th. Is there anybody on the board or representing the board or representing the applicant for whom that's a problem? Seeing none, okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. If I could just, one of the things that's useful, once you have the eighth as a further day, then yep. if there's somebody who feels scruples about uh, participating in the meeting, on the 30th because it's in the middle of passover mm -hmm. the it, it, the what we do will be on acmi the, there'll be more of a public hearing on the 8th and so it gives people an opportunity not to not to throw away their shot uh, mm -hmm. by virtue of the schedule okay Mr. Chairman, if that is acceptable to the applicant, I would just ask them to provide a written extension, um, probably to the ninth, just to make sure we don't have any confusion. That's not a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, the next item on the agenda um, is the pro forma review. So pro forma review is a review of um, the pro forma financial information from the applicant. This takes place after um, the board has issued a decision, um, then the applicant needs to make a decision as to whether or not they feel the project is economic. Um, and at that time, if they declare that the project is uneconomic, um, the board is allowed to request a copy of the pro forma for review um, by a friend, by an accountant um, to, to confirm the, the assertions made in the pro forma. And the review of that is something that can be retained under 53G funding. Um, I believe that's correct, Mr. Haverty? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And so um, I have received um, some recommendations from a couple different um, from a couple of different sources. I have talked to a few different accountants, um, and the, I would like to recommend that the board um, retain our Robert Stankus, who's a director at CBIZ, um, to serve as uh, the, the accountant for that review, should that um, come forward. And as that would be under uh, 53G funding, um, his budget he has sort of estimated that um, to perform a full review would um, be between uh, twelve and fifteen thousand dollars. So we would um, request that the uh, applicant uh, provide uh, funds in the amount of fifteen thousand dollars for that review. Is that something we need to vote on, Mr. Haverty? That is something you would need to vote on, but, but Mr. Chairman, I, I do think you know we do have a draft decision that has been submitted to the applicants. Mm -hmm. um, but you, we haven't listed the number of units that the board is proposing to allow under mm -hmm. the draft decision. So yep. I think that in order to allow a process to move forward. Um, based upon a pro forma review, we would you know, need to get that information into the draft decision and to the applicants before they could actually prepare a pro forma. You know, that shows the impact of all of the conditions of the board's decision. Agreed. I think the board should endeavor to get that resolved tonight. Okay. So that we can move forward on the pro forma review process. Is it premature for the board to request the funding at this time? Well, I think it's it's appropriate to inform the applicants that you intend to go through the process. Okay. Um, of course, that also, when you issue the draft decision to the applicant in the first instance, they have the right to simply state that they accept the decision as drafted, mm -hmm. that therefore there would be no pro, pro forma review. So we do need to take into account that that is at least a potential Okay. Uh, response that we may get from the applicant, although it may not be. Um, but once they've determined that the board's decision renders their project uneconomic, then they would be um, required to inform the board of that, and then the board could initiate that process. Okay. All right, then I will hold on that item at this juncture. Um, <clears throat> so the next item is um, so the uh, the applicant provided on uh, Monday a letter to Mass Housing which is a notice of project revision which noted the uh, revisions that were made to the project um, in the November 8th application of last year um, and the board is in receipt of a letter from town council um, that to Mass Housing, that they that the uh, excuse me the select board would like to submit written comments to, in regards to that notice, um, but they will be voting on Monday at their regular hearing to do that. Um, but part of the so this this uh, this notice occurs under uh, general laws under fifty six zero four section five. And what that section provides is that the, there is a review that's, the applicant notifies Mass Housing about a change in the project. 
mass housing either responds back um, immediately or is allowed to let a period of 15 days expire before they, um, without issuing a, any statement, at which point it is assumed that it is approved. And the, due to the short period of time we have remaining, um, the board, the, the chair feels that it is important that the board request a more expedited review from Mass Housing, which is something the board is entitled to request. Um, so I did send a, a draft of that letter to the members of the board this afternoon uh, for their review. And um, would like the board to approve uh, the sending of the letter. Mr. Haverty, does that, does the contents of that letter, should I be um, displaying that at this time? I don't think that's a concern, Mr. Chairman. I, I <clears throat> Don't think I got it, did I? Um, I that is a very good question. At this junk, I could not be positive right now. Okay. But I don't see a problem sharing it. Okay. So this is the basis, the basis of the letter. So in the second paragraph, I would change that um, to state that now the hearing would be scheduled to close on or before April 9th, 2020. Thank you. I'll go ahead and close that. So with the uh, recommended change by Mr. Haverty, do I have a, a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mellon. A quick go down the roll. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And Mr. Ravelak? Aye. Thank you all. So I will complete that letter and send that off in the morning. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, if you send it off in the morning, you're going to have to adjust the date, the, the date. number of days left down to, to 28, which just goes to show how hard it makes it to put a counter in like that. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take care of that. Um, OK, so in a moment, I will reopen the public comment period on the architectural and urban design aspects of the proposed project. The public comment period was unfortunately cut short at our February 16th hearing due to the expiration of the allotted time on Zoom. At the time the hearing was closed, there were two speakers with their hands raised. So I will reopen the public comment period for 30 minutes. Uh, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the architectural and urban design aspects of the project, should be directed to the board for the purposes of informing our decision. 
to provide for an ordinary, or, excuse me, orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair will limit individual public speakers to three minutes and encourage them to use their time to provide comment related to the indicated topic. The chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations in regards to the project. The procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for the previous hearings. Please select the raise hand button. In the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by your name and address. You'll be given three minutes for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Once the allocated time has expired, the public comment period for this portion of the evening's hearing will be closed. The board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be pulled up during your comment, please ask us to do so. Okay, I will bring up my clock. Okay. I will. So one more person waiting in the waiting room. Okay. So I will start this evening um, with uh, Mr. Eric Siegel. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Give us your name and address for the record, please. Can the host raise your hand, Joel? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Great. My name is Eric Siegel. I live at 84 Milton Street in Arlington, in East Arlington, uh, in the neighborhood, I think uh, very close to where this project will be. Um, I've lived in this neighborhood. I moved here uh, 37 years ago, and uh, I feel need to talk about this project tonight. I expect I'll probably lose a few friends, but I think it's important. Um, I have lived here for a long time. I've experienced the parking and flooding issues that uh, some of the opponents to the development have expressed. But at the same time, uh, I was also one of the people holding a Black Lives Matter sign out on Mass Ave last mm. year. And I, I think I, I wanna talk about it from both those perspectives, kind of some of it is opinion and some of it I think is fact. I understand that there's a lot of people who are concerned about uh, flooding and parking. Uh, for me, affordable housing is not just an essential issue, it's an issue of racial justice. And that's why if you look at organizations like the NAACP and the Urban Institute, they put such an emphasis on affordable housing. Here in Arlington, we don't have enough affordable housing. Um, and the provision of 40 units in this development of affordable housing will be life changing for 40 families. To me, that's extremely important. Now I know uh, as we're balancing environmental issues versus affordability issues, that's a difficult question. Smart people might have preferences on both sides. But I think one thing that's not a question of opinion, but fact is that uh, this development is going to happen. The, the law is on the side of the developers you know, maybe the town can put it off six months or a year, but it's going to happen. And if you don't believe that, look right across Route 2 at the Regal Belmont or the Royal Belmont. Belmont fought that for many years. Uh, but again, the law was on the side of the, of the developer and it happened. I mean, in that case, there were, they had the tallest silver maple in the world in that lot and it was cut down. And even with that, the development still happened. So I think given that the development that Thorndike Place is going to happen, I would urge the ZBA to support it with conditions and to use this opportunity to, to mitigate flooding, mitigate traffic, maximize affordability, instead of kind of waving our hands, running down the road and hoping it doesn't happen. And then in a few years, we can all say, well, we did our best. I'd rather see a wonderful development there that addresses these issues than, um, just uh, kind of try to blindly stop it. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for hearing me, members of the board.
beg your pardon. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Um, next is Heather Keith Lucas. Ms. Lucas, if you Hello, can. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hi. My name is Heather Keith Lucas, and I live at 10 Mott Street. I've lived here 15 years. Uh, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Mr. Siegel. I believe that racial justice does not mean that we put a vulnerable population housed in a flood zone. I've attended many of these hearings and I recognize that the majority of us here are white. Um, the majority of us here are likely in well positioned um, financially. There are more appropriate alternatives for supporting Arlington's efforts to improving access to affordable housing. This is very important work. Um, the current scope of the Mugar development houses people in a flood zone. It's well known um, and it's, it's wrong for everyone. Um, the intent of improving affordable housing in Arlington at this site will have detrimental impacts on the very people it's purporting to support. Unless there are clearly mitigated ways that can be explained. Um, and, and I urge the zoning board to also be able to articulate specifically in the draft, um, the draft letter for approving this site to ensure that should it go through, the flooding is truly contained and that we won't have 172 units, 25% of those units being affordable housing not having that the population that we put there as white people to have their cars flooded, to have their belongings in the storage area flooded, to have the underground um, trash area flooded, which would be contaminate would would provide a public health issue. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for listening to my concerns. Thank you very much. Um, the next on the list um, is Patricia Brown. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much. Um, I have just three quick Sorry, if I comments. Can ask you to give me your name and address Sorry. correctly, please. Sorry, Patricia Brown, 49 Mary Street. Um, I've just got three short comments. Um, and I've heard this address somewhere else, but I'm not sure I've heard it addressed recently. Um, in regards to traffic, um, I know that there was somebody who posted that the width of the streets originally was measured at 40 feet, but they're not. They're about 25 feet. I don't know if that's been addressed because that's a lot of traffic to put on narrow two-way streets. Um, second, and that's true of both um, Dorothy, it's true of all the streets in, in this neighborhood, but the traffic that's primarily gonna go out on Little John and on Dorothy, um, that's a lot of cars to put on narrow streets. Second question I have is that with the redesign, um, we talking about affordable housing, but originally there was affordable ownership, not just affordable rentals. And I'm concerned that that's gone away because yes, it's great. We have some affordable rental housing, but as everybody knows to build the wealth, you need affordable home ownership and that's kind of gone away. So I'm concerned about that. And the third thing is with the move toward trying to do green energy, has anyone done um, any kind of calculations about the neighbors, are they going to have issues with being able to put solar panels on their houses because of shadows that this very tall building next door to these houses are going to cause? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, next up is uh, Mark McCabe. Hi, my name is Mark McCabe, Ford Dorothy Road, Arlington, Mass. And did you get everything? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. please. I just want to make sure I got through. <laughs> I do have a little trouble with this. Uh, this, you know, like everybody else, I do have concerns about the traffic, the flooding, the crowded streets, and also uh, the uh, talk that the this development reflects the, the neighborhood. Uh, which I feel is completely out of control because there is no development this large uh, within the neighborhood itself. And, uh, and that goes back to the, the traffic uh, problem. Uh, and I was, unfortunately, a, a 40 page uh, decision of application I just got yesterday. Uh, very difficult to read through all 40 pages and understand the, the wording. But uh, <clears throat> from what I saw, uh, there was a study that showed that there would, there would be 31 vehicles uh, trips um, and at, in a uh, short period of time and 486 trips on an average weekday uh, going through a community of uh, very narrow streets, parking on both sides, and uh, I, when I'm not sure when all this was done, uh, but when the pandemic is over and people go back to uh, using this neighborhood as a commuter parking lot, it is going to be just a complete disaster to the community. Uh, I'm not sure when they did any traffic studies. And if, if they did it during the pandemic, uh, I think that traffic study is this similar to measuring uh, snow in the middle of July. Uh, it just doesn't handle or uh, it doesn't show the true uh, uh, problems that happen in this neighborhood already without the uh, development of uh, Thorndike Place. Uh, I was a little concerned also that the, the boy was granting waivers um, local bylaws and regulations, uh, even though they will, knowing that they will have an adverse impact in the local concerns. Uh, I know concerns, uh, you know, are, are people who have lived here and have lived here for some short time, some long time, and uh, appreciate their homes, appreciate their neighborhoods, and which will be completely changed by uh, a development of this size. Uh, and it also seems to me that affordable housing, I, I certainly have no problems. I mean, affordable housing is, is like everybody knows is, is needed, but the idea, you know, the idea of building affordable housing on a floodplain and also uh, an area, uh, that is a, uh, a wetlands, uh, you know, it isn't a place that I think affordable housing should be built. I mean, there, there are other places where affordable housing could be built. And- uh, I could ask you to wrap up. Yeah. Okay, I'll wrap Fair it up. Enough. No problem at all. Um, you know, I just, like I say, the, the, it, it, this is only gonna be a problem with traffic, flooding, crowded streets. And one quick thing is I know I was on the Parks and Recreation Commission and we were trying to make the parking lot at <coughs> Thorndike Field a little bit bigger so that it would be safer for the people who use the field. And we had a lot of problems trying to get more uh, parking space there unless we made it a permeable surface. And that was just a small, small project compared to what is going on. And I, I don't see the same uh, concern about flooding or anything like that. 
And, you know, because Thorndike Field does get flooded already, and I think we will lose the use of Thorndike Field. And I appreciate the time for every for everybody on on the board and anybody else who's listening. And I am done. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Um, uh, Mr. DiBiase, just give your name and address, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. I have lived here for over 30 years. I've lived in Arlington my whole life, which is about 55, 57 years. And um, quite frankly, I've got many concerns about this project that I've stated to the board previously as well. One of them being the excavation project of this foundation that's gonna go in the ground. Nobody has given us really a definitive answer on the depth of the excavation from street level to bottom of footings so that we know what the actual displacement of water is really gonna be in terms of cubic footage entirely and what the mitigation process would be for us. Because we're gonna be looking at you know, solid groundwater underneath us, there's gonna be strong water pressure. Where is that all gonna to deplete to? Where, where is that gonna stand for us? That's one of the biggest questions that I think all the neighbors surrounding us are because you'll see I have, I have um, sent in a few photos recently of just the most recent rainstorm of Thorndike Field and around the surrounding area, all flooded. Um, I think you may have received them yesterday or last night. Uh, one of our other deepest concerns, if this project was to go through like it is, is the module build out. When you do module building, you usually have a very, very wide street. You're not dealing with 24 feet, you're usually dealing with 25 and you're blocking street lanes and you're preventing traffic from flowing through so a crane can place these items. Not only do you need a crane, but you need 18 wheelers of boxes to come through, which are the basically the big module units. And I think that if you're gonna grant a permit, it also has to be proven that these things can come in without disrupting the, the personal life of everybody that lives in this unit, in this area rather. You've got residents that have to come and go on a daily basis, some of them elderly that need healthcare, and I feel that there's gonna be restrictions for these people to come and go on a regular basis. Um, that is one of the biggest things, especially for the, for the elderly. If they should need 911 services, emergency, emergency care, they're gonna be deprived of that. The last thing that I have coming across is the Vox. You guys have re, re let's see, let's, let's put it this way. You have used the Vox for your parking um, references, your traffic references, the Vox has above ground parking. They don't have below ground parking. Reason being is they're built on piles. It's an absolute swamp over there. I used to maintain that property for the Martinettis for over 35 years. So I know that area very well. They have pumps in the ground that constantly move the water to get from one place to another to prevent the flooding of the buildings. Those pumps run normally about 20 hours a day. Now, if we put this foundation in the ground next to me, because I'm a direct abutter, I'm exactly right next door. My biggest concern is what's gonna to happen to my home? How am I gonna be guaranteed that I'm not gonna come home and find three feet of water in my basement because they're pumping out their basement into my lot? And I think that the board needs to really look at the superstructure of this and how it's feasible to actually place this in a thickly settled district that we're in. You're looking at R1 and R2 residents you know, before we had the buffer zone of those nice little townhomes, if you will, and now they're being scrubbed out and the building moved right up to the street. Some residents have taken pictures of the recent street with the moving truck on it. And it shows about eight feet to get by the moving truck on Dorothy Road. Other residents have taken pictures of Lake Street most recently with it being backed up all the way into Belmont today. And we're not even through the pandemic yet. Things aren't even open. So this, I'm sorry. So I can just ask you to wrap up, please, sir. Sure. Um, I guess we're just as residents of this neighborhood, we're just hoping that our concerns are taken into the board and that they can sit and actually look at the whole demographics of this area and make sure that the feasibility of this can work without property damage as well, because all of our homes abut the street. And if you've got 18 wheelers, tractors, cranes, we want to be guaranteed without incident that we're not going to have issues on our own properties because of it. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Next thing on the list, um, well, it's truncated. 
Um, Matthew, maybe uh, Matthew McKin something. I apologize. It only gives the first five letters of your last name. Oh, that's okay. Uh, my name is Matthew McKinnon, and I live at 9 Little John Street in Arlington. Please proceed. Hi, Hi Christian. I have posed a question uh, during the last meeting uh, regarding some information that the applicant uh, had provided to us about donating the land to the town of Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, my question uh, was regarding uh, any sort of help that the applicant or family, the Mugar family, has provided either Arlington or the surrounding towns of Cambridge and Somerville who have dealt with the homeless population on the grounds, uh, who have you know, set up tasks for, task, force, task forces to clean up uh, multiple um, uh, you know, times over the years. Uh, I was told by Stephanie Kiefer that she would get back to me on that question. I was wondering if I could ask uh, Stephanie if there had been any uh, follow up for me. I can, I, can ask her, I can ask her on your behalf. Um, that would be great. Thank you very much. That is my only question. Okay. Um, Ms. Kiefer, do you have any information in that regard at this time? Sorry about that. Um, I just asked, could you restate that question? Just so I make so certain. The question is, um, if the, the current owners are participants in the, um, the assistance and the with the uh, homeless population on the property? Um, in, in terms of moving forward with that, um, the, the, the homeless population and, and how any coordination goes forward, I, I think it's still an, an open issue that um, is um, a dialogue actually with, with, with the board, the town, the, the applicant um, in, in terms of doing that. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky issue. So I don't wanna give a, an oversimplified answer, but. Um, well, I think the question was more uh, a question of to date, is the family involved in the, in these, in the ongoing efforts? Um, aside from the, I'm not aware that the uh, that there's a coordination right now with the um, the Arlington Police. I, I believe has a, a designated division that mm -hmm. helps with homeless, um, and I don't know that there is anything that involves a public-private partnership at this point. Mm -hmm. If that answers your question. Oh, I, I I think the the question was just very direct as to whether the Mugar family is directly involved in the in this action, and it sounds like. That may not be the case. I, I'm not aware that there's, as I said, I'm not aware that there's a, a public-private going on mm -hmm. with what the actions at the Arlington um, Police, the, the division of it that, that deals with um, okay. the homeless population. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ms. McKenna, does that answer your question? Uh, the, I mean, I, from my, what I get from that is the answer is no. Um, I would, you know, uh, rather than you know having just a building plop down here and saying it's for the good of the people and the homeless or people who need housing, uh, but the applicant and the family for the past however many years that this land has been here and open uh, hasn't done a thing to help the homeless who have been living on this land. Uh, so it's it's sad. <clears throat> the question has been answered as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have time for a few more. Um, I apologize that the um, Zoom does not maintain the order that people pop up their names. And so they kind of go back and forth. And I apologize for that. Um, I will call on uh, Jeanette Cummings. Thank you. Jeanette Cummings, 32 Dorothy Road. To respond to the concerns of the neighborhood, my one question is, have the members of the board visited the site? And if not yet, when would they be doing so? Um, so I can't speak for the others. Um, I was there uh, last week, um, specifically uh, measuring the, the width of the street um, and look, looking at sight lines through the site and trying to assess um, sort of where the property comes out 
um, on Margaret's screen on the other end there to sort of try to evaluate things. Um, and then every every time I drive up Route Two, I take a good solid uh, look at the at what's in the in the in the woods at this time. Um, but I think that other members have made time on their own uh, to go visit the site. We have not gone as a group, obviously, um, because of the because of COVID restrictions. I have been trying to get um, an understanding with the Board of Health on another project to go visit, and we're having a little trouble working that out. But um, I do believe that members of the board have visited the site and are are very much aware of the conditions of the site. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Rowe? Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, I appreciate you all hearing me. Um, I am now an East Arlington resident, but I really wanna speak for the town of Arlington. Um, and I'm speaking to the Zoning Board of Appeals and also to the neighbors and to Mr. Siegel, um, many people know me as an affordable housing person. I'm one of a handful of people that started the Community Preservation Act. And part of that is building affordable housing is probably the most successful statewide project to build affording, affordable housing. I'm also a landscape architect. And the reason I've been against developing this site is because it is a swamp. The people that live around it know that. My neighbors know that. I don't want anyone to live in that location. As many people have said already, why would you want somebody to live in an affordable unit to have their cars um, flooded and all their um, storage flooded. This is just, it's not the right thing. Our state delegation is against this. I know the Zoning Board of Appeals is doing the best job they can possibly do, and I applaud them for that. But I think you need to really think long term. The town has been against any development on this site for decades. The Board of Selectmen, the town meeting have been against it. So I'm just adding my voice, but I'm, my voice is for all of Arlington, not just East Arlington, and it's for affordable housing. We have a very good affordable housing project in the middle of Arlington that is a friendly 40B. This is not a friendly 40B, and we need to have our um, <coughs> waivers and the uh, comments about this project be as strict as they possibly can be. And I thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Mr. Urowitz. Good evening. My name is John Urowitz. I live at 47 March Street for 37 years. At uh, the last meeting, the applicant pledged $350,000 over the next 10 years to police the property once he builds, once he builds his building. Where has this $350,000 good neighbor money been for the last 12, 15, 15, 40 years? These people have been there. The mess has been there. Why now? Why not before? Kind of like a little treat for us. Uh, the letter written to Jessica Malcolm at the state by the applicant's lawyer softened the blow of this development. It made it look like they were bending over backwards to accommodate all the residents and what we want. Well, what the residents want, the pressure from the residents is not shade lines and signage and bicycle racks. The, re the pressure from the residents don't build this thing. It's an invasion, okay? It's a quiet neighborhood on quiet streets and it's, and it's on a wetland. When they build this four acre underground garage, that's gonna displace a huge aquifer. And the displacement of that aquifer is gonna come into our basements. One answer I haven't gotten yet is from Miss Noise of Oak Tree Development. I'm looking to learn is if this thing is gonna be built, are they gonna be putting in driven piles or aggregate piles? I need that answer. 
um, I can forward that question. I believe that question was answered at the last hearing, but um, I would ask Ms. Noyce and Mr. Clipfell, I believe at the last hearing you indicated that you would not be driving piles, but you would be proceeding with either um, uh, the, the pile that the, the gentleman referenced or helical piles, is that correct? Uh, yes, we, we have talked about um, with, with a geotechnical engineer who assured us that aggregate piles, uh, aggregate uh, piers that were, would not be driven piles would, would be uh, most appropriate for this construction. Thank you, Ms. Noyes. Uh, Mr. Urwitz? Yes, uh, that, I, I understand this too. Aggregate piles do have a compressor uh, that pushes the aggregate down into a pre-drilled, a pre argued hole in the ground. There will be some vibration, even though it's not the same as a driven pile. This is the time where we look to Arlingtonians to stand up for Arlingtonians. The huge vibe, the uniform opposition to this project has been going on for years, for decades. We're having these conversations now, and everything sounds like when you talk shade lines and bricks and park and all that, like it's already a foregone, foregone conclusion. I hope that's not the case. We want the Conservation Commission, the Select Board, town meeting members, Board of Health, school department, and especially the all-powerful ZBA to stand up for our nice neighborhood and turn this thing down. Nobody wants it. It does no good. I also learned that Something like this, if it's built within a one mile radius of a transit hub, Alewife Station, that the state will kick back some money to the town for allowing this thing to be built. So it sounds like they're selling us, the neighborhood, out to build this development. I, I, that's deplorable. Um, I could ask you to wrap 20, up, please. I, I'll wrap it up. Um, the, the, the 25 weeks of delivery of these, these modules on the back of these big trucks, these things are going to wipe out some of the lower branches of our trees on Little John Street. Little John Street's going to take a beating during the two and a half, three years of construction. And for the rest of the life of this building, please do not approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Aaron Freeberger. Hello. Hello. So, name and address for the record, please. Sure, but to, to underscore Clarissa's point, I live in Arlington. I think it's irrelevant how close I am to the project, but I am. I live at 20 Parker Street, Arlington, Massachusetts, 02474. And I apologize already for my frustration. But I have a key point and a key question. So the first is, thank you for your time, for giving us the time. I realized that this meeting came out of the fact that I was one of the people who raised their hands previously and was not able to speak. I do wanna underscore the fact of this ongoing, sustained, collective opposition for this project cannot be emphasized enough. Every person who's spoken ahead of me tonight has mentioned a point that I agree wholeheartedly with. So there is so much concern here. And my fear is that my three minutes of speaking points may or may not be addressed in the context of this larger piece. And so where I'm getting frustrated and where I see a theme here is two things. One, as a neighbor, uh, living in this neighborhood, it feels that there's a lack of context. So Jeanette's question asking quite sincerely and honestly is if people have come to the neighborhood is because it feels like no one gets it. So whether it's 24 feet or 25 feet or 30, whatever the width is, I haven't bothered to go measure my street because I know how wide it is. I know that if a neighbor parks across one side of the street, I can't park on the other because a car can't get through. That's a fact. I don't need a tape measure to do that because I live here. So the concern that I have here is that we keep asking questions. And then again, to John's point, we get answers such as, I think we just heard uh, Ms. Noy say, an expert assured us what is most appropriate. That is not an answer. So we are giving very concrete concerns 
And while I appreciate in the ZBA letter that it addressed that there are concerns, what we're missing because we don't have the expertise, the time, the full understanding here of the scope of this project, because this is not what we do, we are missing the point by point connection from the ZBA to help us understand that you are hearing us, that you hear us with context, and that the points in the letter that of the of the um, the conditions match back to that. So as an Arlington citizen, I implore everyone on the ZBA meeting, um, the team, to help us understand that, to help us understand the connection of what we're saying and that we're heard and that it matches back through. So my particular question now is an actual question that I want an actual answer for, is I don't know from the time I've spent understanding this, the height of the building in the latest rendition from the ground where a person would stand to the height of the top of the building, whatever that's called in architecture language, I wanna know the height of the building, please. And I'd like to know the square footage because what I'll then do with that is calculate that. So I have an understanding compared to the Hardy building, compared to the um, apartments off Spy Pond, or Robbins Library or the high school, because I need the context to understand what we're talking about here. When the Oak Tree Development has given pictures, I don't trust them because that is not the view that I have. So my question is the height of the building and the square footage of the footprint. Could someone help me with that number, please? Uh, yes, please. Um, John Hessian from BSC, can you respond to those two questions? Possible you're on mute if you're not. Um, I'm now off mute, Mr. Chair. Um, I may need Scott Vlasic to um, lend a hand here. The So the elevation of the street, Dorothy Street, is approximately elevation 10. I don't know what that means. Oh, we're getting so, there. Okay, thank you. We'll get there. We'll get there. So if the street is elevation 10. The first floor elevation is elevation 13. So the first floor sits about three feet above the street, which is you know, similar to a lot of the homes on Dorothy Street that the first floor is set up, you know, actually probably a little bit more, four to five feet above the, you know, the sidewalk or street grade. And it's at its highest, it's a four-story building. And this is where I need, may need Scott. I, I believe it's 11 feet floor to floor. So that would be 44 feet plus 13 is uh, 54, 57 minus 10. So it's 47 feet above you know, the pavement, the sidewalk on Dorothy Street. And John, this is Scott. Uh, you yep. are correct on the floor to floor height. Uh, it is 11 feet. Yep. And then um, I don't have the exact number, but the the total square footage in the you know residential building is 195,000. Um, call it maybe a, a little under 196,000. Does that sound right, Scott? I don't have that number right in front of me. Uh, yes, I, I will look that number up right now. Just give me a minute. And Thank you for that. So for my understanding for context, I believe my house has a footprint of about a thousand square feet. And so that's helpful to know this is about 195,000. Well, um, just for Oh, through the chairs, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, that's the total square footage of the building on all four floors. Um, that's that's not the footprint on the ground. Oh, that's what I'd like. Yep, I'd like to know the footprint. Okay. Um, Is it a fourth of that? Yeah, the, okay, the footprint I can find a lot easier. Hang on one minute. Yeah, not exactly a quarter because there's portions of the building that are two and three stories. So it's not just a divisible by four number. That, that's correct, John. Uh, so the ground floor 
footprint of the ground floor of this building is 51,497 square feet. 51,497. Yes, and that appears, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the uh, on the plans that are have been submitted to the board. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Thank you. So I had given uh, a half hour to try to address the, these questions that relate specifically to the. Um, to the building and the, the site, we kind of drifted a bit from that. But um, this last uh, this last participant here has really sort of come back to the building. So, with that, um, I would like to move on to the next portion of the meeting. There will be public hearing again this this same meeting, um, just so everyone is aware. So I'm going to conclude the public comment period for this portion of the evening, and we'll now move on to the discussion of the pro proposed draft decision. Um, so the remainder of this evening's discussion will involve the proposed draft decision released to the applicant and the public. In preparation for this discussion, I'd like to remind the public of the options before the board. So the board is allowed to take three different decisions um, on this application. We are allowed to approve without conditions. Um, and so the, whatever the applicant has provided, we are allowed to vote and approve that without any conditions and allow it to proceed forward. The board is allowed to approve the project with conditions. So we are able to take what they have requested and we are able to condition it um, in conjunction with what the board finds or the local needs and we are allowed to issue that as a decision. Um, that decision is appealable by the applicant uh, to the uh, housing court, but it is also appealable by the resident, by the abutters. Um, and then the third uh, possible decision is that the board is, is allowed to deny the project. Um, if the board denies the project, uh, the board can still be appealed. The project can still be appealed to the um, the Housing Appeals Committee, who can overturn the board's decision. Um, but if we deny, uh, abutters' appeals are also not allowed. Um, and so the decision of the HAC, the Housing um, Appeals Committee, is final in that regard. So Mr. Chairman? To... Yes, please. Um, can I ask a question? No. The, uh, of course, if we were to say no, there would be nothing to appeal because that's what the abutters, or at least some of them, have asked us to do. Um, but I guess the other question that Mr. Haverty might want to answer is whether they can intervene in the in the applicant's appeal to the housing appeals committee so that they can make the same kinds of arguments they're making here. Invite the housing appeals committee to. Uh, uh, learn more about their uh, their neighborhood and their concerns and present whatever arguments uh, they have as to why the Housing Appeals Committee should uh, affirm what the board has done. Do they have the right to do that or uh, or don't they? Mr. So, Haverty? Yeah, so abutters or other uh, aggrieved parties do have the right to request to intervene in the Housing Appeals Committee process. Um, However, in order to do that, you need to be able to show that one, you would have standing to do so, um, which would require you to be harmed in a manner that's special and different than the rest of the neighborhood. You would also have to show that your interests are not being protected by the board with regards to the specific interests that you are setting forth. So in the issue of a denial, I think it's unlikely that any party would be allowed to intervene in the Housing Appeals Committee process uh, because it would be presumed that the board would be representing and protecting the interests of the abutting property owners. In the in instance of an approval with conditions, um, it is possible and it happens frequently that uh, neighbors that are able to establish standing are able to intervene in the Housing Appeals Committee appeal. I did wanna note that with regards to appealing a, an approval with conditions, the applicant's appeal route is to the Housing Appeals Committee, whereas uh, a neighbor um, or someone who is aggrieved by the board's decision has a right 
to appeal directly to either superior court or land court pursuant to general laws chapter 48 section 17. So that's the exact same kind of appeal that uh, an abutter would have uh, on the issuance of a special permit or a variance, uh, the de novo appeal, and then you would just start over in the process on that appeal. The way the law works, if there are joint appeals filed, so if the, the board issues an approval with conditions that the applicant determines renders the project uneconomic, and they appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee, but an, an abutter or a group of abutters appeal the board's decision to the land court or superior court, the abutter appeal is automatically stayed by operation of law, and it becomes moot if the Housing Appeals Committee overturns the board's decision. And then they would simply need to try to appeal the Housing Appeals Committee decision. Thank, thank you, Mr. Havard. Does that answer your question, Mr. Hanlon? Yes, it does. Perfect. Okay. So the board will uh, now begin its review of the proposed draft decision. Uh, the board will abide by the following procedure to discuss the document. So the board will review the, the 33 items that comprise the procedural history, jurisdictional findings, and factual findings sections of the proposed draft decision. The board will then invite the applicant to address those same three sections of the proposed draft decision. And the board will then invite the public to address the board on those same three sections of the proposed draft decision. Um, the chair will um, would like to encourage the public to participate in that section, but if the, we also invite the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the deliberations and in the record. Um, so I will go ahead and put display on the screen um, this document. So procedural history. Um, so the application for a comprehensive permit received by the town on or about August 31st, 2016. Application proposes the development of 12 home ownership units, six townhouse structures, 207 rental units, and single four-story structure for the total of 219 units located on the property. Um, so that was the original application. Um, and uh, Mr. Havity, it was recommended uh, to me that somewhere in the procedural history, it should be noted um, which version of the zoning bylaw and which version of the wetlands bylaws were in effect at that time. Um, Mr. Chairman, it would be all local bylaws um, are those that were in effect at, as of the time of the submittal of the comprehensive permit application. Okay, uh, where, is that noted in the procedural history anywhere? I, I don't think so, but we can certainly add that. If you could make a note to do that, please. Yep. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. In, um, in light of the evolution of the application, um, would it be more sensible to use the past tense here and say the application proposed the development of that is described in this paragraph since that's no longer uh, what the proposal is as I understand it? That makes good sense. Okay. Um, on this to this point number two, the board's public hearing on the application was duly opened on September. We um, we need to find that date. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Valorelli, do you have access to that date? I can find out that date, uh, Mr. Chairman. Get back okay. To 
Um, on October 6, 2016, the board submitted notification to the applicant pursuant to 760 CMR 56038 that it met the one and a half percent land area minimum safe harbor. October 21st, 2016, the applicant appealed to the board's decision to the Department of Housing and Community Development. On November 17th, the Department of Housing and Community Development issued a decision, decision ruling that the board's safe harbor notification was an error and determining that no such safe harbor was applicable. The board timely appealed this decision to the Housing Appeals Committee. On October 15th, 2019, the, the Housing Appeals Committee issued a decision upholding the determination of the DHCB and remanded remanding the matter back to the board. At the request of the applicant, the hearing was resumed on December 10th, 2019. At the December 10th, 2019 hearing, the applicant requested a further delay of public hearings until April 14th, 2020. Due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the hearing did not actually resume until August 25th, 2020. Subsequent sessions of the public hearing were held on October 13th, 2020, November 24th, 2020, December 8th, December 22nd, January 26th, 2021, February 16th, March 11th, and, and so the next date will be March 30th. Um, and then the hearing most likely will be closed on, I believe we said uh, April 8th. Um, the project is located on the property, which is located off Dorothy Road and Parker Road in Arlington, Massachusetts. Mr. Chair? Yes, please. I believe that may be a Scribner's error. Um, I'm not aware of a Parker Road in that vicinity. Ah. I think it may, might be little supposed to be Little John. Well, certainly, the, I'm trying to think. No, what it's the, not. There used to it's be a Parker Street John. driveway. Parker Street is the one in East Arlington. Parker Street. It, it's the entrance to the homeless people. Yep. <laughs> Not Parker Road. Okay. We will work to get a better definition for that. And that is line item number three. <clears throat> Mr. Four. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. I wonder if, I mean, I, I think we might want to work. It, it's fine to say that the property is located off Dorothy Road and Parker Road. Parker Street, but uh, so are many of the people who testified before us tonight, and uh, I would like to see us provide a more precise description of the property. And I, I and I'm looking past various things to noticing that the property consists of all of it and not just the five acres. So it would it would be nice to have a more a more precise. Uh, identification of exactly what the property is. Okay, so we should bound it by by Route Two and Thorndike yes. Field yes. and the uh, adjoining properties. Right. Okay. I couldn't agree with him more because there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the rest of the land after the five point some odd acres of land. So if, I get, if, I, Chairman, if you look at this portion, if you look at no, um, number 14 on page five, may I ask you who's speaking? I can't. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, but I'm trying to find out who this is. This is Paul. Oh, Paul, sorry. My, I, I can't see the pictures anymore. <laughs> oh, uh, so if you look at number 14 on page five, there is a more detailed description of the parcel. The project is located on a 17.7 acre parcel of land located between Concord Turnpike Route 2 to the south and residential neighborhoods to the north and east of the property off mm -hmm. Dorothy Road and Parker Road, which should be Parker Street. Park Street. Mr. The Chairman, I to the east by Birch Street and the Arlington Thorndike Plainfields. The property is located within the Plain Dean Development Zoning District. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if it, if that can just be brought up here. Paragraph yeah, four, that, that was what I was which to we're about to get to. It also has got some problems with it. Uh, Salem Street is a potential problem, and Thorndike Field is actually is is if I look at it right to the east rather than to the west of this project. So, uh, you you have it right in fourteen. It would be useful to stay, get it right up here. Okay. You need to add a little John as well. Yes. 
just to add, my name is Mark McCabe for Darcy Road. And I think Thorndike should definitely be added to the whole process of what is going to be going on. Mm -hmm. So this, if, if, if I may, um, as, as chairman, this, this portion of the, of the hearing is for the, the board to go through these um, and to make his comments. I, I, I appreciate that members of the, the public have very positive comments to make and very, um, very appropriate comments to make, but it, it, it's highly confusing in the Zoom environment uh, when there are voices just sort of popping out. So I, if, if people could please respect the, the, uh, the chair's wish to um, keep this with the board for the time being, and I do promise that there will be given due time for the, for the public to make comment. Uh, Mark McCabe, respectfully so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, so it sounds like three and four, we need to sort of re, it sounds like if we bring 14 up, it will it will basically address the issues with three and four. Um, is that your, your sense, Mr. Hanlon? I think that's true, if Mr. Haverty agrees. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so number five, um, property consists of approximately 17.7 acres, of which 11.5 consists of floodplains, while 5.6 consists of buildable upland. Um, if I could ask, um, Mr. Hessian, does that comport with what you have? I believe my recollection is that those are the numbers that were in the original 2016 application. Okay. Um, but th there, you know, the word approximately is in there. Um, yeah. and, and just based on the development parcel that we've proposed and, you know, the uh, potential conservation parcel, we're at, you know, a little over five acres for the development parcel and in the 12 and a half for the um, conservation, it, it those numbers are, you know, close. If you, okay. if we need them to be more accurate or, or exact, they, that, that can be worked out. Okay. But for the for the for the original application, these are these are approximately correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I th I think this is Pat. Um, I'm concerned about, again, getting mixed up on these things. This is the board speaking. And as far as anybody reading this looks, would, would assume that they're speaking as of today. Mm -hmm. If we want to say the original proposal was a certain thing, then we should say that. If we want to say that the property is located in a certain thing and, or, <clears throat> excuse me, the, and uh, we, we, should, we should say that as well. Uh, the here, this the the numbers that we have here don't really correspond to the numbers that we would use for the existing project, mm -hmm. and beyond that, I it may very well be that the applicant maintained that some of it was in floodplain and the other and the rest was buildable upland. But as we know, on the basis of the last year of hearings, it's much more complicated than that. And it seems to me that the only thing that we need to know here is that the project, the building will actually occur on a certain number of acres, leaving over uh, the what we've been calling the unbuildable acres. And however we say that is fine, but I, I wouldn't as a member of the board want to say either that all the stuff that's outside the buildable area, the, the area that the project is supposed to uh, occupy, not all of that is floodplain and not all of where the project is, is actually buildable. So uh, those, no, those words are really not appropriate coming from us. They were originally contentions of the applicant with, with which I wouldn't entirely agree. How do you think we should remedy that? I think that we should just substitute in the, the, the num I would say that it, the project consists of a building that will be located on approximately five acres or whatever the number is that Mr. Hessian just pointed out, leaving an unbuilt a, a portion of the pro property which is not built upon that would be it's relatively it's 12 and a half acres and leave it at that. Okay. 
Mr. Haverty, is that somewhat clear? It is. I, I guess my only concern is I think it is helpful to have a finding in the board's decision as to how much of the site consists of floodplain. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's an important thing to be in there. <clears throat> But Mr. Chairman, if I could just respond to that, that that may be an important thing, and I don't necessarily agree with that. But to me, that's not part of the procedural history, and it's not a description of where we are right now. Uh, it's it's actually complicated to figure out what exactly is floodplain, and it's and there are other kinds of resource areas and so forth. We've been through that with the Conservation Commission, and it just not it's not as easy as just dividing everything between floodplain and buildable. Uh, but if we want to say that in more detail and get it more precisely, I think that actually the findings of fact here ought to be a little more, uh, uh, a little more detailed and, and, and more than there are. Uh, there will be a time to do that. If, but I, I don't know. I mean, I would actually have to ask Beta and the applicant to really bear down if we wanted to define what floodplain, how much of it exactly is floodplain. Uh, we can probably figure that out. I don't think that we can figure it out in conversation in the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, let's, let's move on from this one. And, um, and Mr. Hamlin, maybe you and I should discuss this one offline. Okay. Okay. Um, Number six, the applicant provided various materials, reports, studies, and revised plans throughout the course of the public hearings. The, number seven, the applicant submitted revised plans on November 3rd, 2020, reducing the number of units in the project to 176 units. This revision also eliminated the six two-family townhouse structures originally proposed by the applicant in favor of an all rental development in a single structure. Number eight, the applicant submitted several, uh, excuse me, submitted revised architectural plans dated February 16th, 2021, revising the proposed rental structure to step back above the first two floors of the structure on Dorothy Road near the abutting family residences. Number nine, during the public Mr. hearing. Mr. Chairman, for number eight. Yep. I, I believe these are the plans that the number of units were reduced to 172, is that correct? That is, that would be correct. So we should note that in this. Okay. Um, and then number nine, uh, during the public hearing, the applicant was assisted primarily by its principals, uh, Gwen Noyes, Arthur Klipfell, and its counsel, Stephanie Kiefer, Schmalek and Vaughn LLP, civil engineer, John Hessian, PE of BSC Group, and its traffic engineer, Scott Thornton, PE of Vanessa and Associates, Inc. Uh, number 10, the board utilized the services of its review engineers, Beta Group, Inc., with Martin Nover, PE, Todd Unza, PE, William McGrath, PE, handling civil engineering and wetlands peer review, and Greg Lucas, PE, for traffic. The board also utilized the services of Town Council Douglas Heim, uh, Planning Director Jenny Rate, and other town staff. The board also represented during the course of the hearing by Special Town Council Johnson Witten of KP Law and Paul Haverty, Blaman Borowski, and Haverty LLC as this chapter 40B technical consultant through a grant for the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, I believe we are missing uh, one person from Beta Group. Um, Mr. Chair, this is Marta. Um, I'm, I am not a PE. Um, so in um, Julia Stearns. Julia Stearns. Yes. In while we're at it, um, Greg Lucas is also a PTOE, along with a PE. E, okay. PTOE. Julia Stearns a PE? Um, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm on the Zoom call. What are you doing? I'm on the Mugar Zoom call. <laughs> yes, you are. Rick, can you track that down? All right. Thank you so much for bringing that wine. It was really good. You did. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Number 11, uh, during the public hearing, there was a significant public input. The board heard input from the butters and other interested persons throughout the hearing process. The board also heard significant input from town departments, including the Conservation Commission, Department of Planning and Community Development, the Transportation Advisory Committee, Select Board and Engineering Division. The board also received significant input from the Arlington Land Trust and the Mystic River Watershed Association, both independent local nonprofits. Um, is there anyone on the board who recognizes anyone we may have missed? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Do we, and this is a question also uh, for Paul, can we mm -hmm. add in, I did, uh, in the end of the first sentence of number 11 during the public hearing, there was significant mm -hmm. public input and strong opposition or something to that effect? Because I believe that should be either there or in the findings at some point. Mr. Haverty? I have no concerns with that, that's fine. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, this is Pat again. I, <clears throat> the, uh, we, we did receive, I think, two different, two letters from the uh, redevelopment board. And we, while we didn't receive those recently and on the most recent iteration, it may be appropriate to put them here. Um, I think it also, if we're discussing the nature of the public controversy, it would probably be useful to mention the uh, interventions that we have received from the, uh, uh, from the delegation, from Rep. Rogers and Rep. Garbley and, and from Senator Friedman. That's all well taken. Moving on to the jurisdictional findings, um, item 12. Um, so the applicant has demonstrated its eligibility to submit an application for a comprehensive permit to the board and the development fulfills the minimum project eligibility requirements set forth in 760 CMR 56041 as follows. The applicant is a limited liability company has indicated in its application that it will conform to the limited dividend requirements of G General Law 40B, Section 2223, thus establishing it as a limited dividend entity. The applicant has principal address of 222 Berkeley Street, Boston, Mass. 02116. The applicant has received a written determination of project eligibility for mass housing dated December 4th, 2015, under the New England Fund Program, copy of which was provided to the board with the original application. The applicant provided deeds dated September 8th, 2015, recorded in the Millsec South in Book. 1479 at page 27. Thus, the applicant has shown evidence of site control sufficient to qualify, excuse me, as an applicant for a comprehensive permit. The applicant has agreed to execute a regulatory agreement that limits its annual distributions in accordance with General Law 40B and the regulations 760 CMR 56 and guidelines adopted there under by DHCD. Um, so with the most recent um, notice of, of change, Mr. Haverty, does that affect this section? Um, it doesn't affect this other than with regards to the written determination of project eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we should add something that the notice was submitted to the subsidizing agency, but we would have to leave blank to wait to see how the subsidizing agency um, determines okay. that notice. You could go ahead and make a note to do that. Yep. Okay. Um, number 13, uh, town of Arlington, the town, did not meet the statutory minima set forth in General Law 40B20 or 760 CMR 56033 to 56037 at the time the original application was filed, except as noted below. At the time of the filing of the application, the number of low or moderate income housing units in the town constituted 5.64%. 
of the total year-round housing units in the town based on the most recent pu publicly available copy of the DHCD subsidized housing inventory dated blank. Okay, um, so I need to get that date. So is that the date that was in effect at the time of the filing? It, it's whatever the most recent publicly available copy of the subsidized housing inventory was as of the date of the filing. And it could be you know, up to a year or two because they don't update it that frequently, the publicly available subsidized housing inventory. Okay. Not going to watch. So I just need to figure out what the, the coffee was that was in effect as of that date. Okay. But that's something you can locate? Yep. Perfect. I didn't mention one point. Um, B, uh, the board has asserted a claim that there are existing affordable housing units that are on site that comprise more than one and one half percent of the total land area of the town that is zoned for residential, commercial, or industrial use, excluding land owned by the United States, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, or any political subdivision thereof. The board timely asserted this claim pursuant to 760 CMR 56038. The applicant appealed this claim to the Department of Housing Community Development, which issued the decision dated November 17, 2016, reversing the board's safe harbor determination. The board appealed this decision to the Housing Appeals Committee. On October 15, 2019, the Housing Appeals Committee upheld the decision of the Department of Housing and Community Development. Because this decision was not a final decision, the board was not able to pursue an appeal pursuant to General Law 30A14. At this time, the board reserved its rights regarding this safe harbor claim. C, um, the granting of the comprehensive permit will not result in the commencement of construction of low or moderate income housing units on a site comprising more than three tenths of 1% of land area in town or 10 acres, whichever is larger zone for residential, commercial, industrial use, excluding land owned by the United States Commonwealth of Massachusetts or any public political subdivision thereof in any one calendar year. Letter D, the town has an approved housing production plan pursuant to 760 CMR 56034, but is not currently within or eligible for certification. Uh, e, the town has not achieved recent progress towards its housing unit minimum pursuant to 760 CMR 56035. F, the project is originally submitted does not constitute a large project pursuant to 760 CMR 56036. And G, the applicant's comprehensive permit application does not constitute a related application pursuant to 760 CMR 56037. Um, so those are the jurisdictional findings. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, do you have anything else you think should be included in this section? I don't think so, no. Okay. So I think the only question we had on this one specifically was in regards to 13A, uh, looking at the date for the, that the housing survey was done, the housing inventory was dated. Yep. Okay. So this brings us down to section three, factual findings, uh, location of the projects. So 14 um, projects located on a 17.7 .7 acre parcel of land located between Concord Turnpike Road 2 to the south residential neighborhoods to the north and east of the property off Dorothy Road and Parker that road should be the street. The property is bordered to the east by Birch Street and the Arlington Thorndike playing fields. The property is located within the planned unit development zoning district. So we want to add something with regards to the proximity to Little John Road? I think so. Or we could say that it borders yeah, I think you could say it borders Dorothy Road at and the and the to the to the corner of Little John Street. Okay. Little John Street. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if it's possible we've we've already talked about essentially bringing the contents of this paragraph up mm -hmm. uh, to earlier and it seems a bit odd to repeat it and I was wondering if if there's some way of of cross-referencing it and so forth so we don't have to have the same paragraph appear twice. But I, I think, and I would ask Mr. Haverty to let me know if I'm right. I, I think because it's in the fi the factual findings section, um, it, we because we need to determine it as a, as a finding that that is the deter that that is the location of the project that it does need to appear under findings. Yeah, we could take it out of the procedural history. It doesn't need to be there. I mean, it's really just sort of a background information in that section. Right. Okay.
Okay, number 15. Um, the board engaged in review of potential civil engineering sites. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have a comment on uh, on the uh, on uh, 14. Oh. Uh, if I may. Can uh, we add at the end of the first sentence um, um, where it says off Dorothy Road and Parker Road? You see that? Uh, just to better describe the neighborhood and add, which consists primarily of single family homes. Is Mr. Chair, Steve Revelak? Yes, please. Is it single fam primarily single family or uh, single and two family? I recall there being a row of two families on Dorothy Road. I'm going off the language by, um, I believe, uh, by other reports that describe it as primarily single family. I know there are some two family. Would it sound better as, or I guess would it be more accurate to say primarily single family homes or exclusively single and two family homes? Mr. Chairman, it, it seems to me that we ought to be saying what's accurate here. The, mm -hmm. And it's single family and two family homes. And th that's what it is. I don't think that it's important or useful for us to try to decide what's primary and what's not. Mm -hmm. I will point out that the two family homes are a line of townhouses built right across the street. <clears throat> and they may think of themselves, if not the primary homes in the neighborhood, at least they're pretty significant. So why don't we just say what it is single family and two family houses okay does that work for you mr o'rourke yes it does perfect okay so going on to 15. um Board engaged in review of potential civil engineering site design, traffic, stormwater, floodplain impacts of the project. Um, the pro number 16, the project will connect to the Arlington Municipal Water and Sewer System. I guess that should be systems, plural. Uh, number 17, the applicant originally proposed 315 parking spaces for the project, a ratio of 1.44 parking spaces per unit. The applicant subsequently reduced the parking ratio to 193 spaces or approximately 1.12 spaces per unit. The Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee recommended that as a transit oriented development, the project should not have more than one parking space per unit. Um, so that is, so that none of this is a condition. So we are not taking a stand on any of these positions at this time. We are just stating that these are right. what we what we have been what has been offered to us in terms of testimony. Um, Mr. Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Th um, this is sort of a general comment that's going to work through, and it's not something that can <clears throat> that can be fully addressed or even partly addressed really uh, in, the, in the course of just a conversation this evening. Um, but one of the, th the things that I think is, is missing here is a fuller discussion of the factors that make this such a challenging site and breaking it down into pieces in the way we do here, um, saying how many parking spaces and so forth you know, it kind of omits that, uh, not just the flooding history, it, it, it omits a lot of things that are driving what it is that we are trying to do and what others are trying to persuade us to do. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that in order to meet the sort of level of transparency that was urged upon us earlier this evening, it would be helpful to sort of think through what kind of general background of this, of this sort and maybe that goes into the question about what's buildable and what's floodplains and have something that is a page or two, maybe not, not a huge amount, but that really gets across what it is about the project that gives rise to all of the problems that we're trying to answer when we get to the, to the condition. So I would encourage us to just sort of put that on our agenda and see what we can do 
uh, between now and the next time we have a hearing and, and have something specific to propose. Uh, but in general, it, it, when you read this, I think most, many of the people, you just don't have to get the feel for why it is that it's such a controversial project. It, it doesn't sound nearly as hard as, as we all know it really is. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. O'Rourke. I agree with Mr. Hanlon. You don't really get a feel for the problems that the, you know, the, the neighbors face in the places. Talking about the description of the property, as Mr. Hanlon said, what's floodplain, uh, and also talking about access, that how access is from Lake Street, that the issues with Lake Street, and I believe we can pull a fair and rather short summary from the reports we have um, that describe both the issues with the property itself and uh, access uh, and um, traffic. I don't know if it's if, if it's worth us doing that tonight because it's going to take a little bit of work. We could probably do some of it, but uh, I, I agree with Mr. Hanlon. We should probably come up with uh, kind of a quick summary um, that we can insert here to really capture the, the issues with the property. No, absolutely. Um, I was looking to see if there was a different section that it might fall under, but it absolutely would fall under this um, under this section. Um, Maybe just an introduction, you know, between 14 and 15, you start on civil engineering and you get into some specifics, maybe just having a more in 14 uh, would provide a place for it. Okay. I mean, after 14. The first section is the location of the project. So maybe we then, just before we get to civil engineering, site plan, stormwater impact, if we could have something about like character of the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. Or description of the neighborhood or whatever that and we can try to try to do our best to capture it. I mean, obviously we you could write war and peace about this actually, but we can't. And we so it we'll leave out important things, but but we could put in some more important things to make make again make the whole thing more transparent. Okay. If it's the general sense of the board to do that, I'd be, I'd be willing to try to come up with some language and suggest it to Mr. Haverty who can perfect it or you know, just take some of the burden off because it's it involves writing a page or two. Yeah, I was gonna ask if maybe if you wanted to, to work with Mr. O'Rourke on that. I'm gonna do that, Mr. Chairman. All right. That'd be great. I think that, Mr. Work, as you said, I think that's a very important that this get incorporated into the findings um, because they, it, it's really this aspect of the, the of the property, it's the, the these conditions of the property and the neighborhood that will form the basis of the of the conditions. So we need to make sure that that is very fully captured. Um, So, uh, I think we left off at the end of 17. So number 18, uh, the applicant did not originally propose bicycle parking. With a reduction in the number of units, the applicant revised the number of proposed bicycle spaces to 176 interior spaces with additional exterior spaces. Um, I'll just ask Mr. Hessian, was there a specific number of exterior spaces? I couldn't find a number on the plans. I wasn't certain. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's um, there's not a specific number of outside spaces. I believe the the rack by the you know main um, access in the courtyard uh, can handle a, approximately 16 bicycles. But we can okay. confirm that, and then um, I think Scott. Thornton knows the exact answer on the, the number of bikes that will be accommodated at the proposed um, blue bike station. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, this is, a, a, I'm sure it's a Scrivener's issue, but we start off saying that the, that the applicant did not originally propose bicycle parking. And then we go to say with the reduction of number of units, the applicant revised the number proposed. 
And if we ne if they never <clears throat> proposed it, they couldn't have revised it. I'm not quite sure what is actually meant, whether there was an intervening point where they did propose it or whether what we saw with the revision was really the first proposal, but whatever it is should be clarified and, and gotten right. Okay. I think it's more the latter that the, that with the revision came the, the incorporation of bicycle parking. Yeah. Um, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, this is Scott from yep, BAI. Please. Yeah, as far as the uh, as far as the blue bikes station goes, I think later on in your decision, there's a specific reference to the blue bike station. So okay. maybe we could bring it up at that point. Okay. I think if we we could indicate here, I think just for the findings that that the applicant, you know, provides you know provided 176 interior spaces. With approximately 16 exterior spaces plus bicycle, uh, you know, plus short-term bicycle rental or something like that. To, to, so that we, because I think it's important that it, unless, did you say it was in the findings or is it actually in the conditions that it gets picked up again? Oh, I, I think it is in the conditions. Okay. I mean, if, if you, if you did want to add it here, it's, it's a 23 uh, dock blue bike station. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to we need to make sure that we include that in the finding. Okay. Thank you for finding that. Um, so that brings us to number nineteen. On-site amenities will include uh, recreational areas and structures as shown on the approved plans and referenced below. And then approximately blank percent of the site will consist of impervious surface, with the remainder consisting of pervious surface. Um, Mr. Hessian, I don't know if you've run those calculations for the most recent plan. I know it was sort of in a little bit of a hand-drawn version the last time we saw it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, we, we have not. I mean, you know, we're, I think the site plan is, you know, is starting to stop moving, but, um, you know, it was moving up until the last hearing and the, we submitted that updated site plan today that, um, you know, is, is an effort to try to reflect what was presented um, schematically on the hearing on February 16th. So we don't have those numbers um, right at hand right now. Okay. Would you be able to, to run those in the, in the near term and get back to us with that? Sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, just for yeah. clarification, that would be um, in calculating the percentage that would be on the entire 17.7 acre parcel. I think it would be helpful to have it both for the entire parcel and for the proposed developed parcel. Okay. Thank you both. Um, Number 21, uh, board finds that the tree planting and landscaping details proposed by the applicant and as conditioned by this decision uh, is insufficient in light of the site disturbance that the project will entail. Um, given the extent of vegetation proposed to be removed within a resource area, the applicant must provide a landscape plan as described in section 24 and should include the elements described in the guidance provided in section 24E as follows. Um, I believe, I, I'm not totally sure, um, Mr. Hanlon, but is this what you had referenced to me earlier where it, it's, a, it's in the findings, but it sounds a little bit more like yes. a condition? Yes, I, I think that's right. Every, I mean, ultimately what should be in the findings is that if, you, if we have the condition right, then presumably mm -hmm. we will find that the landscape plan is is uh, is sufficient, and I think that what this is telling us is that the landscape plan, in this respect, is not sufficient. The references here, I believe, are to the wetlands bylaw that are administered by the administered by the conservation commission, and it seems to me more logical to make put this in the conditions and not put it 
put it in the findings. Among other things, ultimately someday people will be looking at this as a document and the, what they'll look at is the conditions and they won't be looking at the findings to find conditions. So uh, it's, it's important to sort of separate that out and make all of the things that are in the imperative mode in the conditions part. Okay. Mr. Chair, this is Steve Revelak. Yes. Um, I, I agree with Miss. I had the same, uh, was going to bring up the same point about this section. Um, and also, if we could explicitly state what section 24 refers to. Ah. Okay, so I'll. I'll put this one on me to take a look at 21 and separate that out. Um, 22 stormwater management has been designed in compliance with NAP stormwater management standards in accordance with 310 CMR 10056 K through Q and defined in detail in the Mass Depth Water Stormwater Management Handbook. The system incorporates best management practices to facilitate total suspended solid removal, infiltration, and retention of stormwater flows. Uh, 23, the board finds the applicant must provide a compensatory flood storage mitigation plan for the proposed compensatory flood storage area to mitigate the negative environmental impacts. So I think this is similar to 21, and I will right. go ahead and look at that as well. Really, 24 is also the same, and, and so is 25. All, all of them are essentially conditions. Okay. All right, so I'll look at those, those four together. Um, uh, 26, the project is conditioned herein will address the lack of affordable rental units in the town. Um, I think that's correct unless the board was to condition that there be home ownership units, in which case we would need to reconsider that one. Um, 27, the board heard testimony from the applicant and the board's peer review traffic consultant, including the applicant's traffic impact study prepared by Finesse Associates Inc. that the project is expected to result in approximately 31 vehicle trips during the weekday morning peak hour and approximately 38 vehicle trips during the weekday afternoon peak hour. There will be an estimated 486 total vehicle trips on an average weekday. These figures are based upon the proposal for 176 units. Um, so I could just ask Mr. Thornton to, uh, if he could, not necessarily at this time, but if he could just verify those numbers for us, that those are the correct and current figures. Um, I can give you the correct numbers now, if you'd like, Mr. Chair. Oh, that's even better, sure. So uh, the 31 for the morning yeah. should actually be 27. So there was a follow-up memo that changed the numbers. And I had tried to combine those two. Okay, so so I think this is so. So mm -hmm. if we're if we're basing it on the on the original traffic study, yep. then then it I think it should be referencing the numbers that are in that study. Okay. In that case, it would be it would be the twenty seven during the morning, thirty three during the afternoon, and four hundred thirty on the average weekday. Okay. And then the, the, the memorandum that had come out that had recommended increasing those values, what was that? Can you just refresh my memory as to exactly what that was? Yeah, I, I think um, actually if, if Mr. Lucas is on, he can probably uh, chime in on that. But I think that was, that was a, um, an attempt to, uh, uh, take an alternative look at uh, some of the way the vehicle trips were calculated uh, using a, a varying mode split. Um, mm. and I think, I think that's where yeah. the, the other Mr. numbers Chair came in. Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's Greg Lucas from Beta Group. Um, <clears throat> the numbers shown here under, um, <clears throat> excuse me, number 27, do represent the addition of um, those additional trips based on the you know, taking a second look at the mode split um, 
in addition to what was shown in the original traffic study. Um, by the same token, Mr. Thornton's correct that to say that the traffic impact study, um, the numbers were different that were in the traffic impact study. Um, perhaps there's a way to word this to say the applicant's traffic impact study and subsequent memoranda prepared by Vanass Associates would kind of capture that trail of, you know, comment and response that led to the numbers. And I did take a quick look um, earlier, and these numbers do total um, what we identified as additional trips um, from the revised mode split in addition to what was originally shown in the traffic impact study. Okay. So these numbers, 31, 38, and 46, are correct in that regard. And perhaps it's just necessary to mention subsequent memoranda um, to clarify that that's the sum of the discussion. Uh, thank you. That's a very helpful clarification. Okay, um, that's number 28. Uh, during the course of the hearing, the applicant submitted a plan showing a reduction in the number of rental units to 176 units. The applicant further modif introduced further modifications to its design during the hearing process, which further reduced the number of units to 172 units. Uh, number 29, the board finds that the conditions imposed- Mr. Chair? Please. Sorry, Steve Ravalak. Yeah. Um, so going back to uh, the item, yes, item number 28, yeah. um, would it be worth mentioning the the motivation behind or the reason for the reduction um, in order to you know, reduce the massing at the front of the building and um, you know have it more closely resemble the uh, the height of the adjoining structures? Sure. So that that's for the reduction from 176 to 172, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Number 29, the board finds conditions imposed in section four of this decision. Uh, are necessary in order to address local concerns. The board finds that such conditions will not render the project uneconomic. To the extent that such conditions may render the project uneconomic as defined in 760 CMR 5602, the board finds that the local concerns outweigh the potential benefits of the proposed affordable units. Um, number 30, the board finds that granting certain waivers from local bylaws and regulations is acceptable, even though granting waivers may have an adverse impact on local concerns. Uh, 31, the board acknowledges concerns raised by abutters and other interested parties about the project's potential incompatibility with abutting residential uses, particularly relating to stormwater and floodplain impacts, as well as traffic and parking impacts. The board has addressed these concerns by the imposition of appropriate conditions. The board further finds that conditions detailed below appropriately, excuse me, appropriately address these matters of local concern in a matter, manner that outweighs the regional need for affordable housing. The board finds that the conditions imposed below address local and regional housing needs while properly protecting valid issues of local concern. Uh, 32, the board finds the construction of the project as conditioned will be consistent with local needs. And 33, the applicant has proposed that the, pro the portion of the property outside of the development area shown on the plans as containing approximately blank number of acres will be either placed under conservation restriction or deeded to the town. The applicant has proposed a one-time payment of $100,000 plus annual payments of $25,000 for a period of 10 years for cleaning up the existing debris and invasive species on this portion of the property. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's apparent that, uh, that all of these sort of, the, these findings are pretty tentative. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that we're in a position to say that we are, that we, <coughs> that we can find all those things right now. So it I think it's not worth it to try to, to wordsmith them at this point, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to everyone realize that 
that we 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 may come someday to to find these things, mm-hmm. um, but now, but we're not really completely there now. At least, not not all of us are completely there now. And there's a lot of discussion about conditions and uh, and other things that would be necessary in order for to allow us to actually stand behind what we've put here as placeholders. No, I completely agree. I mean, the the conditions are intentionally right now. Um, left somewhat open-ended because there, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues before this board in regards to this project, and um, I think that that those are substantive discussions that we're going to need to have that we will um, have in, starting in our in our next hearing um, in regards to uh, the conditions and how we condition it. But uh, I had wanted to ask Mr. Haverty, I think. In some regards, uh, 29, 30, 31, and 32 are fairly boilerplate. Is that? That's correct. OK. And then 33 was the proposal from the applicant in regards to the additional property. Um, Ms. Keeper, did you have a number of acres that you originally had provided for this? Not Ms. Keeper, maybe Mr. Heshton. Hi, sorry about that. I couldn't find myself to unmute myself. Uh, with respect to number 33, is that yeah. what you're asking? Just how many acres were proposed to be placed under the conservation restriction or deeded? Uh, what we had, uh, what we had uh, proposed was approximately 12 and a half. And um, that number obviously needs to, um, as, as you've indicated before, you know, there's sometimes there's things that are moving targets. So, um, but we can put that in as a placeholder for now. Okay. And the monetary figures are correct, right? Um, those were the monetary figures that we had stated, yes. Um, and we had also um, referenced that uh, for the conservation piece, um, we had suggested to the town or, or a nonprofit. So that's okay. Um, I know the board's still continuing its part, so I'm not trying to nope. overtake that. And I believe that you had also at the, at the same time mentioned something in regards to um, some kind of like a stewardship committee. Yes, we had, we had pr- proposed that there be um, a, a sort of committee designed to help, you know, oversee the, uh, uh, the property and, and or the, uh, the conservation parcel. And in terms of, you know, whether there's a plan to move forward with any sort of pathways through it, um, those sorts of things. Okay. And that it be representative. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Orr. On, on 33, I know 33 is in flux and it's not set language. Um, if we're gonna add something like 33, um, I, would we, I think we should consider adding another paragraph expressing the concerns we've received over uh, that issue uh, from the town, particularly the town manager's memo today in, in some proposed language uh, that we've received um, from, you know, the boards uh, expressing their concerns about the condition of the property that we need to go in there as well. I think that's well taken. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that should, how to include that, but I think that um, either as a part of 33. It would be important for context. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, just as a suggestion, this is yeah. Pat. Um, another paragraph. I mean, the first this paragraph ought to say, as Ms. Kiefer has pointed out, what the applicant has proposed, mm-hmm. and then it would be perfectly logical to come up with a paragraph afterwards to say that the town and the land trust and whoever have uh, expressed difficulties with that. And then to describe, this is still factual findings. And so we're really just describing the issues on both sides. So a paragraph that says that would be, would set the stage for what will come later on when we talk about exactly what what we propose to do. Okay. And then uh, another question for um, Mr. Haverty, I'm not quite, 
sure. Um, so the the volume of comment that the board has received from the public, um, how does that get incorporated into the record? Does it make this? Is there a reference to it specifically in the decision, or is it just in the in the record of the proceedings? So we can certainly, and, and that could be something that could be added to the procedural history in terms of if there is a running list of comments that have been submitted, we can include that as a document. Um, if not, we can simply acknowledge um, you know, the, the volume of information submitted from the public and that it's available in the, the Board of Appeals office for review. Mm -hmm. Multiple ways that you can address that. Okay. Following up on that, Mr. Chairman, may I ask another question? Please. Um, could we, in that vein, it, is it possible, uh, and maybe Mr. Habitick can answer this, if we wanted to cite the specific things that were presented by neighbors and abutters, such as pictures of flooding or pictures of traffic backing up that we've received, um, where can we do that in the decision? Is that part of the factual findings, or can we just reference that in um, in, if we get to conditions? I think that if there is a specific document that you want to reference in the factual finding, you can note you know, what is contained in that document. I wouldn't attach it as an exhibit to the board's decision. I mean, at the end of the day, this is something that's going to have to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and we don't want to overload um, the, you know, the amount of paper that's going to have to get recorded. But I think you could certainly you know, note that it's in the board's records and note what the concerns are in a factual finding. That's perfectly appropriate. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board in regards to uh, these first three sections and first 33 items in the proposed draft decision? Assume there are none. Um, so I will return to the start here. Um, I will ask the applicant to please address the, those same sections. Um, and would it be easier, um, Ms. Keeper, if I just if I stop sharing and let you? Um, actually, no, you can, you can keep sharing if you, okay. if you wish, um, that way, if I reference a, a, a section, you can just scroll to it. Um, okay. I think I'm okay with that. Um, it just as a, uh, as a preliminary comment, um, Go ahead. You could please proceed. Thank you. Um, as a, as a preliminary comment, um, Can you hear me? I can. Oh. I think it's my internet that's wonky. Mr. Chairman, I could not hear her. Oh, okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you now. Okay, very good. Um, as, as a preliminary um, matter, the, uh, the, uh, the applicant and our, our team received this yesterday. So we, um, as a team, I think um, the, the most prudent course is to go through it as a team to go through it. So we've not had that opportunity to do that. So the, the comments that I'm going to give right now are, are somewhat preliminary and, and perhaps more um, suggesting an approach than um, going through, as you just did, going paragraph by paragraph. Um, and, and I don't want to um, take up too, too much time. Um, in, I appreciate into that. Um, with respect to the procedural history, um, generally, um, you know, we can provide uh, perhaps a red line to certain, you know, adjustments or, or language or okay. something. Um, one substantive thing, though, and and Paul, you can feel free to weigh in on this. And this this gets into um, whether it's 
um, within the procedural history or if you put it in the, the findings itself, but often what you have in the procedural history is there, there's a reference, um, paragraph six, that spoke to uh, the applicant had provided various materials, reports, studies, and revised plans throughout the course of the public hearing. Oftentimes what you'll see in a comp permit decision is a, a listing of all of the documents and it would be, it would include um, um, the peer review comments as well from, from, from beta as well as um, from um, comments that have been received perhaps by the boards. Um, and then there, there's two ways that the, the board can handle in terms of the public comments because there have been a lot and I don't know how hard that is to catalog. I've seen some decisions go and they, they list kind of all of the, the technical things. So the, the submittals of the, the plans, revised dates, the, um, the engineering reports, the, the peer review, the responses to peer review, the comments from conservation commission, um, the planning department, et cetera. Um, and then they may say something like, you know, and, and, and numerous comments from the public if it becomes too voluminous and you can't do it. And sometimes they put it in the body of the decision itself, or they say as referenced in Appendix A, and then you just have Appendix B. <coughs> it just goes through um, and, and, and states that. So that one that may be one thing that may be helpful. And, and again, I um, I don't know if Paul's considered that um, in that, and if his preference usually is to put that as an appendix or, or to actually list them within the body of the decision. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to respond to that. Uh, Please. <laughs> Do it either way. It really depends upon the board in terms of whether they want to include a list of every, all of the documents that have been submitted throughout the course of the, the hearing process. I think that would be a incredibly long list in this instance. However, I definitely would not include the <clears throat> list in the body of the decision. I would have it as an exhibit or an appendix mm -hmm. if that is what the board would prefer. Yeah, I think it would. Please, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I was going to ask Mr. J if if Mr. Haverty could tell us <coughs> whether there's a legal reason to do that uh, in terms of of cre of uh, identifying what's in the record. Um, I it's it's a long appendix, and I'm not sure how useful it is to whoever it is who has to review this later on uh, but if it's if but if you need to do that to define what the record is or to fix what the record is because later we will have a hard time figuring it out uh, that would be different I just am, uh, as anyone who has actually gone through our our website knows uh, it's both it's not 100 percent complete and it would be an enormous task to try to get everything everything in there and i'm not sure that the effort would be worth it unless it there are legal consequences to doing it and getting it right there, there are no legal consequences you are not required to list every piece of correspondence that are received during the course of the hearing you're not required to list all of the reports um, the plans have been listed in the body of the decision so that's already taken care of um, it, it can be helpful but again it, when I did, talked about the appeal processes at the beginning of the hearing tonight, either the appeal to the Housing, appeal, the Housing Appeals Committee by the applicant or the appeal to the land court or superior court by the neighbors, both would be de novo uh, appeals. They would not be an on the record appeal. They would be you know, a completely new process with a new record created. So there's, there's no requirement that the board list all of the documents that are received during the course of the hearing in their decision, because you don't have to create a record um, because no appeal would be based upon your local record. Well, thank you both for that. Um, Ms. Kiefer? Okay, I, I would just um, want further comment on that. Paul's, Paul's right, there isn't a requirement that you do it, but, but um, I, I heard, um, some comments from the board previously that they were trying to provide a, a bit more context to um, to the background. And, and I think that sometimes that does help provide context if you see that it was actually a very um, 
you know, that there was a lot of thought that went into it on, on both sides, you know, on behalf of um, the, uh, the board and its consultants and, and on behalf of the applicant. But, you know, I, I will ultimately, that's your decision, but um, it's not a requirement, but sometimes it does help provide that context that I, I had heard being mentioned before. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm going to move into, I think the jurisdictional findings are, um, they just tend to be um, rather straightforward. If, if we have any comments, we'll provide you a, a red line on that. Okay. Um, and then moving on to the, the factual findings. Um, uh, again, I would reiterate consistent with my prior statement that I, I think that um, in, the, in the interest of having um, a, a more contextual description of the project, um, and, and we can provide this through redlining, but um, you know, there, there's nothing in here that exactly says, um, you know, where, where it describes where on the property the project is to be located. And um, there, there may be a little bit of confusion, but the, the property is, is, or the project, excuse me, um, is is not within you know vegetated wetland, um, and the majority of it's not even in bordering land subject to flooding. There's just two small fingers, and so I think that perhaps um, we can work with uh, I can work with the BSC, and we can just provide a little bit of detail to give an idea of what's on the ground for the project, and then also um, I would suggest some additional information in terms of what the project consists of. Um, and, and I know that that's in part going to be a discussion that the board's going to have, but in terms of, you know, the number of units, um, the number of bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and so I think that, and I, I don't know how you want to handle this exactly, um, Mr. Chairman, but normally I would think that we would provide a red line. Um, but I know that you've made some statements this evening that there's going to be decisions from this. So I think that um, I, it's unclear when the board would have a, a further revision for us to comment on. And since we're looking at really um, two and a half weeks for the next hearing, it may just make more sense for us to provide a red line to the, the current decision that's been handed to us yesterday. Would you agree with that? I, I think so. I mean, I think the alternative would be for the, you know, for the the base uh, for the you know the board to put provide input and revise but i think we would not the, you know we would be revising only these three sections we would not be providing comment on anything beyond these three sections um so in terms of redlining were you meaning within the these first three sections well actually i would mean within the uh within the whole probably mm -hmm. um because i understand that the the board is seeking to impose conditions, but sometimes it's, it's helpful if there's a condition and the applicant and the board may see slightly different, but by proposing something that kind of meshes both concerns, you, you can find a way to be like, oh yes, that, that works. That, that gives, that addresses the concern that we had and, and the applicant says, and that addresses, you know, a very practical design issue or something. Um, yeah. I mean, I think certainly to inform inform the discussion that we have at the next hearing when, when I anticipate we'll be you know, speaking almost exclusively to um, conditions. I think it would be helpful to have, um, you know, the applicant's perspective on those as well. Mr. Chairman? Yes, yes sir. Um, I, think, I, I think that the same point can be made with respect to practically everyone who has an interest in, uh, uh, in, in this project, when, next time we will be addressing conditions that originate uh, with other groups in the town. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be there will be people who in in the community who might want to have conditions that are not there now that they'll want us to consider, and the in, the best way to consider them is either through some sort of a red line version or at least something that says insert this text here or there. Mm -hmm. And it's much, much easier to do that if that is pr provided to us in writing 
relatively early. I mean, I, I know that we've been at the last minute surfacing this, but just as a practical matter, if there are a lot of conditions of this kind, the sheer task of sorting them out and putting and 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 getting everything together so we can see what what's been proposed is going to require some effort. So I just encourage everybody to do it and to do it that way. Because if, if you just have a question, comments in the air are a lot harder to deal with than comments that relate to particular, particular provisions that need to be supplemented, need to be changed, need to be deleted, whatever. Okay. And so I'd encourage everybody to do what, who, what, what uh, uh, Ms. Kiefer has proposed to do. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Keeper? I think without belaboring the point that perhaps that's just the, um, the best way to conclude our preliminary comments this okay. evening is that you know we would propose additional ones and also provide a bit more um, context in terms of where the development is proposed on the site, um, what the resource areas are, where they're located, what the, you know, what the what the parking is, what the what the amenities are. Um, you typically see that in the findings, you know, the description of, of what the project is, and you don't see that here. You don't um, um, you don't have that in here. So I think that we can um, help provide that, and then obviously the board will review it. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Orr. Just following up on what Attorney Kiefer said regarding the conditions and just for the public who've been watching this, um, just because the conditions are there doesn't mean we've decided we're going to impose conditions. And I, I just wanted to make sure that if you, you think that, that should be emphasized to the public, we still have to come to what we're going to do here. And that the proposed conditions there are there in draft form um, for us to start considering, but we still haven't made a decision on this. And, and I just want to make sure that I think that's worth emphasizing and, and tell me if I'm wrong. No, I think that's correct. Sorry, I had something show up on my screen. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> Um, Red line seems wrong. There was a comment made by a, 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 a putter earlier that, um, to the extent that they had concerns about the way this was going. And I just want, yeah. I think it's important to public know this was a draft decision that we could get things on paper and start a discussion. We've only discussed so far through the findings. We have not discussed what we're going to do as far as an approval, a denial, or an approval of conditions, even though the conditions are there. Um, but it's helpful to see if we're going to decide to approve with conditions what those are going to be, uh, especially given the time constraints for under. So that's the reason they're there. And I just thought that was important to emphasize that we still haven't made a decision on what we're going to do yet. No, absolutely. I think that's very well taken that the, um, and I, I think if, if people look through the conditions, you see there are a lot of blank lines in there. Um, and so those are all matters that the, the board needs to make a decision on. And those are all things that um, the board would make will make decisions on through the public hearing process. Um, but my, my sense is that those will not be, that this evening I think we'll, we'll conclude with, the, with these three, with the public comment on these first three sections and then we'll pick up at the next hearing with a more substantive discussion of, the, of uh, what the board wishes to do in regards to conditions moving forward. Um, so with that, I would like to, um, open, reopen the hearing for public comment, um, specifically as it relates to these first three sections of the decision. Um, and if, if people could please try to limit their comment to, to, um, to those sections, it would be uh, greatly appreciated because that's really what we're trying to focus on at this point. Um, I'm going to see if I can find my clock again. Um, so the Chair encourages the uh, the board, invite the public to address the board on the these same three sections of the 
proposed draft decision. The chair will limit individual speakers to three minutes, encourage them to use their time to provide comment related to the indicated sections of the proposed draft decisions only. Um, the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for the for the prior uh, the prior public comment period. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. We'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed to the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps helps us generate an accurate record of the of the reason you're arising for this evening. Uh, once all public questions and comments have been addressed or um, the allocated time of, I'm gonna see if, I think we have, I don't think we have a hard stop at 1030. So I'd like to go to 1045. So we could have 45 minutes um, this evening. Um, I think that would work best for us but it leaves us a little bit of time at the end still to close out. So with that in mind, um, Note. Mr. McCabe. Oh, Mr. McCabe has lowered his hand or disappeared. Um, Uh, Ms. Kukarski. Hi, um, thank you for um, presenting the documents tonight. I just had a couple of issues to bring up. The first being that- oh, I'm um, sorry, if I could just ask for your name and address for the record. Oh, sorry. Um, Anna Kukarski, 34 Mott Street. Thank you. Um, so it seems like the 2020 FEMA maps were not being used uh, uh, for this project as well as um, you know, some of the climate change vulnerability assessments that Cambridge and Boston have been used, uh, have been using for their um, developments. And uh, I'm really concerned that these climate change uh, standards that um, project future precipitation, future um, flooding are not being used for this development because the application was initially 2015. So um, I think that's seems to be unwise to make environmental decisions without the most up-to-date scientific evidence, especially when it will pose a safety and health hazard to future residents. Um, and you know, from a personal perspective, I only moved in for a few years into a new uh, construction and um, you know, it was made with the most modern codes and uh, and engineering and um, you know the flooding started within months. So this was something that nobody informed us about. And you know, this is what I hope that I can do for those future residents that no one did for me is that um, you know, to prevent placing especially a economically or vulnerable population into an area that is known for flooding. Um, that I assume nobody who rents this property to them will inform them. And in this sense, I do believe it is a matter of um, social and racial justice uh, for these future residents, if um, they're, especially if they're, this is going to be for affordable housing. My second comment is that um, the traffic studies, um, the current traffic studies on Lake Street don't account for the new traffic light that's now on the Minuteman bike path. Additionally, I know some uh, other traffic reports that the developers presented were using Vox2 data, and that is on the other side of the highway in another town. Um, so I don't think that's appropriate. And uh, they had their, on their website how it was a similar traffic flow, and it's absolutely not. Um, and if they're only accounting for, I think you mentioned 31 uh, cars total extra in um, on the streets during rush hour for 176 units, which includes two and three unit um, apartments. You know, this obviously shows that uh, doing a traffic study in a pandemic is completely um, misrepresentative. So I am concerned about a lot of the misrepresented 
misrepresentations and distortion of the graphics. Um, you know, the picture of the facade uh, with that uh, distorts the widths of the street, the heights of the bu nearby buildings, which are, you know, cleverly covered with a tree. Um, you know, this really questions the integrity of the developers and the data that they're presenting. Um, I, the, I have heard that the town has offered them other locations to develop in, which they have declined. I'm guessing the reason is because of the location of public transportation. And I just wanna note that the um, Boston public transportation system is outdated. It's uh, severely in debt. The infrastructure is not enough to handle even the current capacity. And so, you know, I don't think that's um, that viable of a reason. Secondly, you know, with saying everyone is just going to magically use public transport. Well, you know, I came to this neighborhood committed to use public transport and not own a car. And we did try that for months and it did not work because we are nowhere near a grocery store, um, nowhere near any play, any doctors or anywhere to buy, um, you know, household hold goods. So it's, you know, I've tried it pers personally and it's not possible to not have a car. We had to, you know, eventually succumb to having a car. And so- I ask you to I, wrap up, please. Okay, thanks. Um, I do think that that is also um, not really a viable reason um, to be building in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Vitiker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Every aspect- oh, Sorry, if I could just get your name and address of the record, sorry. Oh, sorry, Steve Bitteker, 4 Wait Street. Uh, every aspect of the Oak Tree building proposal on the Mugar property is flawed. For the 40, from the 40B to the traffic study, blending into the neighborhood ethics questions and of course the environmental impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Let's start with Oak Tree getting a 40B granted based on outdated and incorrect zoning maps. I'm referring to the zoning maps that have 100 year old cemeteries still listed as R1 or single family residence and R5 low density uh, housing residence. Clearly these properties won't be built upon think poltergeist, and shouldn't have been allowed to be used in the calculation. It simply doesn't reflect reality. Taking the acreage out of the equation, which the town rightfully did, would mean there is no 40B here. This is an example of a large corporation trying to game the system and cheat for their own profit to the detriment of those that would occupy it, the neighbors and the neighborhood at large. Using these cemeteries and other areas that are incorrectly zoned is not in the spirit of being a good neighbor. Rather, it's pushing this building project through under, under false pretenses. Let's talk about traffic. The most recent traffic study conducted by Oak Tree was during a global pandemic where the commuting numbers are a small fraction of what they were pre-pandemic and what they'll return to post-pandemic. This is not a sincere nor serious good faith understanding or representation of the area traffic as it applies to the proposed project. Yet another example of using false data to game the system. Let's talk about blending into the neighborhood. Oak Tree was asked to, in writing, Oak Tree was asked in writing to propose a project that would blend into the neighborhood. If that neighborhood was Mass Avenue East Arlington, they would be spot on next to the other three and four level apartment and condo complexes that line the street. But proposing 176 unit condo 
apartment complex with a massive footprint on the far side or the far end of an established 95 year old single family and two family neighborhood with quiet streets is not a sincere nor neighborly proposal. No, Oak Tree, this massive building does not blend into the neighborhood. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, I would appreciate it if Mr. Bideker could just make his points and not reduce everything into uh, personal attacks on the uh, applicant. Uh, there is a point underneath everything he says. It's not particularly persuasive to be calling people names, and I just as soon avoid that and get to the point. I'll try. That's well taken. If, if you could, please. Um, also, um, you just let you know you're you're pretty much at the end of your time. So if you could just wrap up. Okay, I'll try. Uh, I've, I've been a homeowner living in the neighborhood for 20 years. I've been walking the streets with two successive dogs under over the last 18 years. Uh, having Dorothy Road included on our, daily, on our daily thing, I've witnessed the Mugar site completely underwater where Oak Tree would like to build, specifically directly across from 73 Dorothy Road. The water was a couple inches from cresting from the Mugar site onto the street from the proposed building site. Now, if you're not familiar with the grade there, it goes down about three to four feet from the road. There's a lot, that's a lot of standing water. <coughs> that was the year people had to gut their basements four feet up from the floor, take out flooring, et cetera. Also, I remember uh, the house at 58 Dorothy Road had water covering the lawn coming up from the Mugar site where the proposed uh, building is going to be. Um, on other occasions, Dorothy Road was completely flooded with several inches of water. I had to drive about a mile per hour because residents were telling me to slow down. Otherwise the wake in Dorothy Road would wash down the driveways. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's videos of that out, uh, out and about. Um, okay. I have have yeah, sorry, I have nothing against affordable ownership to build wealth, but not on these, these and many more false pretenses and flaws, uh, such that the proposed project clearly doesn't blend into the neighborhood. Personally, I'd feel awkward living in a such a structure uh, amongst single and multifamily, uh, two family houses. Thank you, sir. So I uh, just one more thing. I, I so I ask, please, sir. I'm asking people to be at three minutes here at like four and a half. Sure. I'm just trying to be fair to the rest of your your fellow neighbors. Well, wow. thank you, sir. Um, Ms. O'Driscoll. Anna O'Driscoll. No, you're still muted. I don't know if you know. We'll have to come back to that person. Um, uh, Ms. Ide. Hi, uh, Marcy Shapiro Ide. I live at 152 Lake Street. I'm at the corner of Lake Street and Little John Street. So besides my concerns about gigantic trucks trying to turn the corner at my house, um, I also am very concerned that we're talking about draft recommendations that I haven't even had a chance to read the conditions yet, but I do um, want to know if there will be a place to put in, I don't know if it would be in the findings or the facts, but the fact of the matter that this building does not fit with the neighborhood, it doesn't fit with the feel as when the townhouses were supposed to be as like a quote unquote buffer to the neighborhood in the original proposal. And this is completely different. I don't know if your draft decision is going to have that in there, but I really think there should be a paragraph that states that that's a fact. That's I, I don't see how you could call it anything else when you're going to 
potentially put a building of this length in a neighborhood that is two family homes along Dorothy with single families around it, it does not fit with the neighborhood. And so I'm hoping you're gonna put that in there. I also agree about the traffic studies. I think that the, or wherever you're putting the info about the expected number of rise in cars, it should be stated that those studies were done during a pandemic. Um, I can tell you that my children had sat and counted cars pre-pandemic about three years before the pandemic of cars cutting up Mary Street before we were able to get a sign put at Lake and Little John saying no entry between four and seven uh, and between at, in the evening uh, because there were times when there were over 200 cars per 20 minutes, it was something once. It's unbelievable, but it's true. Um, so I'm just hoping that certain facts like that are going to get put into the, the document that we were just shown. Um, I also, like I said, I haven't had a chance to read about the conditions. I am very much for affordable housing. I work with people uh, who are very low income and help people secure affordable housing as part of my work. This is not going to solve that problem. Um, and I don't think we can overlook the environmental impacts um, and just say it's okay to build because it's kind of sort of not maybe in a swamp. And I just think that really just because Cambridge built what Cambridge built on the other side of Route 2 doesn't make this okay. And I don't think that anybody is fully listening to the residents. And I feel like it's not right for the people who own the property to not hear that. We've submitted many letters where we've said, fine, you wanna build townhouses, build townhouses. That's in line with what could help the community. You could make it so that those could be a path to home ownership for people who really need it. This is not going to solve the affordable housing problem in Arlington. And I think it's wrong that we can't also include the developments that are underway that have been built in the last six years. Westminster, there's another one on Park Ave Extension where the food pantry is going in. There's gonna be a number of affordable units that are well underway are gonna be done by this fall, I think. And for us to not be able to include those in the numbers, it, it's not right. And I think that we need to look at that seriously because there is more affordable housing that the Housing Corporation of Arlington has underway all the time. And I don't see how we can just say, well, when this was submitted, that wasn't a factor. It's a factor now. Um, there was even a, a building on Summer Street that had affordable units very recently, and I don't see how we can't take those into account. So thank you, and I hope you'll take my considerations into putting some of those into the draft. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah Augud? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name's Sarah Augard. I live at 73 Dorothy Road in East Arlington. Um, if you will allow me, I have one comment and two questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so my one comment is really to agree most strongly with all the comments that the residents have made so far about the unsuitability of this development um, along Dorothy Road. I would like to especially thank Mr. Bittaker for pointing out the flooding at 73, across from 73 Dorothy Road. Um, I can definitely attest to that, seeing as that's where I live. And not only did it flood across the road from 73 Dorothy Road, it also flooded in my basement. Um, I'm a relatively new dwelling in one of the, the townhouses. So as another um, speaker said a little earlier, we have all the up-to-date modern technologies in place, but yet we still flood. 
Um, so that was my one comment. My two specific questions that I would ask the board to consider um, adding to this draft document relate one to hazard mitigation um, and the amount of money that Oak Tree has offered to help clear the hazards from the site. I would suggest that $100,000 is possibly 10% of what it would cost to clear the hazards of that site. And I would encourage the board uh, to get some estimates of what the cost would be before agreeing to such a low figure um, should they move forward with uh, this development. And secondly, I would like to ask for there to be some consideration of if this project was to move forward, the impact on the wildlife and specifically how pest control and wildlife will be removed from this development. Specifically, our neighborhood has lots of children. We have lots of pets. We have lots of cats that go hunting for wildlife across the road in this development. So I would request most strongly that oak tree be required to have any pest control or wildlife clearance plan that they should propose approved by the Arlington Animal Control and that under no circumstances, and I can't underline this enough, no circumstances should poison be used. It's gonna be bad enough if this development moves forward that we lose our neighborhood but to lose our pets and possibly our children as well is just intolerable. Um, so I would ask that the board can consider this. Um, in the interest of time, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, appreciate it. Um, George Hakeem. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 10 Edith Street, George Michael Hakeem. Um, so my house uh, was recently redone by um, Carney General Contracting. They, they basically knocked down the old house and um, redid it. Uh, they have built a lot of houses in Arlington and they, and they know Arlington really well. Um, what they did was they actually filled in our basement. So we have a crawl space under our house and we don't have a basement at all. Um, they know um, because they've built plenty of houses in Arlington. That is not wise or, or intelligent to build um, a basement in this area because of the flood risk. So um, and the fact that uh, uh, this building with a footprint of the tens of thousands of square feet um, that was mentioned earlier is going to be built, uh, you know, into the ground, the displacing groundwater um, seems short sighted uh, and, uh, and not really with the knowledge of the neighborhood. Um, you know, the uh, Carney Contracting is based in Arlington, uh, knows this, and when they had an opportunity to build our house, they, they filled in the basement for that reason. Um, so just to offer that as an example. Um, secondly, you know, wetlands are very, very important uh, water filter. You know, when uh, polluted water, and we live in, I know it's Arlington, and there's trees nearby, and it looks like very nice, but we're very close to a city. Um, it's a very densely populated area. There's a lot of wastewater uh, and pollutants in the area. And when those pass through wetlands, um, water can come out clean the other side, uh, or at least cleaner than it was. Um, and building more in this area uh, will definitely not contribute to the long-term sustainability of clean water in the area, um, nor will it be, uh, a useful sort of long-term place for people to live. You know, if we're talking about affordable housing, um, uh, like a pathway to home ownership, this has been said before, um, I think that's uh, a valuable goal and something that we should pursue in Arlington. This site is not it. Um, I think, uh, you know, out on Mass Ave, certainly in Arlington Center, as was mentioned by some uh, of my neighbors earlier, um, there are some 40B projects that are better suited to this uh, and fitting with the characters of the neighborhood as well as um, 
uh, being places that are not environmentally dangerous. Um, that would also help uh, our you know, affordable housing issue, which is an issue. So um, if we're looking at you know, a small percentage of this new building being uh, affordable housing renting, um, that doesn't really provide uh, a pathway to long-term wealth accumulation. Um, and from a justice angle, you know, it doesn't really accomplish um, what we might seek to accomplish in an ideal circumstances to build wealth for lower income uh, individuals in this neighborhood. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, board and Mr. Chairman for hearing me and uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Um, let's try again, um, uh, Anna O'Driscoll. So you have your hand up. Nope. I'll try again in a minute. Um, Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Um, I wanted to uh, well, first- I just ask your address for the record. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, 64 Piedmont Street. I don't, uh, I am not in the butter and I do feel a little odd going from the momentous uh, points that people are making and very important points to the point I'm going to bring up um, but I'll do it quickly. Uh, I um, wanted to make one reference to uh, under the findings of fact point 21 about tree planting. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the tree committee and one of the items which uh, is a select board policy that was approved uh, not, not long ago, I think it was last year, about how all uh, tree plantings require uh, watering plants to go with them. Now I know I see the term maintenance there listed as one of the points, point G under uh, number 21. However, we need to have, make sure that we reference very specifically uh, a three year watering plan because we have found with trees, if we don't have three years worth of a watering plan, the trees tend to uh, die because they don't get proper uh, maintenance that they need and, and a maintenance plan, you know, that's pruning and things like that. However, a watering plan specifically is something we would like added uh, as a requirement, um, perhaps when you get to the uh, conditions, but I just found that point there in the, uh, the findings of fact. Um, and now as, as just a, a, a private citizen, not as a member of the tree committee, I just want to uh, point out that um, I read the letter that the uh, select board developed relative to recent changes to the Thorndike uh, plan. And I want to encourage the board to take that letter um, and all the points made in that letter because it was quite thorough, I thought, uh, into serious consideration when it comes to whether or not the project now reflects the project that was when the permits of the 40B permit uh, approval case was uh, was issued because it strikes me that this pro this particular project has gone through some rather massive changes that might impact um, the decision that they made based on what the project is now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next, um, Mr. Logan. Yes, thank you. William Logan, uh, seven, I mean, excuse me, five Mary Street, Arlington, Mass, uh, Precinct 2 town meeting member. Uh, I would like the board to also consider the potential loss of field use uh, for Thorndike. Uh, as it is, it's pretty swampy. So to have the extra water there uh, will cause the field to be declared unplayable most of the time. And especially with sports resuming after COVID, there'll be uh, a lack of field use. So that will put a stress on the field. Also, uh, I, I'm not in a butter, but I'm, as I mentioned, I'm on Mary Street. And ever since the uh, properties in Belmont and Cambridge have gone in, uh, my property has started to flood in our basement. Matter of fact, to the point we have little stalagmites growing. Uh, we never had that before the construction. So the reach of this flooding issue can reach even past the butters into Mary Street in that area. Also, to consider the traffic, uh, even though the signs have been put up in those areas, people still come down there and they fly down the streets. And to add people that can actually legally turn down into those streets 
added in with the people that are not supposed to be going there is going to put a heavy burden on our neighborhood, especially with all the children that live there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, um, Matt McKinnon. Uh, Matthew McKinnon, Nine yep. Little John Street. Um, first, I'd like to thank you. I've had you know two speaking times tonight, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I have one question and one comment. Uh, the question is, if the ZBA were to deny the project outright and it goes to the Housing Authority in Massachusetts and they allow it, um, are the abutters allowed to sue the applicants as individuals? I would ask our council, Mr. Haverty, to address that question, please. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking whether the, the neighbors would be able to appeal the decision of the Housing Appeals Committee individually? Uh, yes, uh, if possible, or if to, you know, bring a lawsuit against not the housing authority, but the applicants. So you would be able to appeal the decision of the housing appeals committee. Um, the applicant would be a party to that appeal as would the housing appeals committee. And would that only be for abutters? It would be for anybody that is able to establish that they suffer a harm that's separate and distinct from the rest of the community. I see, okay. So if, so. You, are a, if you are a direct abutter or an abutter to an abutter within 300 feet, you have a presumption that you suffer that sort of aggrievement that's necessary to establish standing. That doesn't mean that you are completely unable to establish it if you are not what's known as a party in interest, um, but it's more difficult. Okay, thank you. And the comment that I had was, I'm, I'm afraid for the town um, getting donated the land uh, without a full, um, you know, ecological survey of the land. I'm afraid if we, you know, if we get this land donated to us, it's going to be a taxpayer burden for the entire town uh, if it's, you know, uh, unfit for anything. Uh, you know, I've heard it's being used for dumping before. There's the homeless population living on the land and probably, you know, there's excrement back there and trash. Um, you know, cleaning up an ecological disaster is not cheap. It's never cheap. Uh, and ecological disaster cleanups are the most expensive cleanups. Um, so I just want that in the back of your mind uh, when you make this decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna call on Mr. DiBiase, but he's raised, he's lowered his hand. Um, Mr. DiBiase, did you still wanna speak? Yes, Mr. Chair, please. Uh, Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. Um, one of the points I wanted to bring up is Oak Tree's done multiple developments throughout Cambridge and the surrounding towns. They've referenced um, Brookside Square in West Concord. I took a ride out there this week just to take a look at the setting that this building was built in. And, you know, it was nicely done and everything, but it's in a commercial atmosphere. Everything was, the, the abutters were all commercial. There was no resonance. And then I took a ride through Cambridge at several of the other sites. None of the other developments really have the impact that this one truly does to us. You know, most of these developments they have done have been um, on Mass Ave, Chauncey Street, Fresh Pond, all the surrounding areas. There was one on Chauncey Street that was really downscale, only about nine units. Ironically, I was working on the same street probably about two years later. Um, but nevertheless, they blend to the neighborhood. The real strategic thing to this was they blended solidly to the area. This one doesn't, you know. And, and it's been repeated over and over again. And I just wanted to make the point across that I did take the time to visit some of their, their recent projects. I drove around, took pictures and looked at them. Demographically, the majority of them all fit in. This one here doesn't. 
This one doesn't fit into the neighborhood structure whatsoever. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Brown? Hi, just one quick um, question. What happens to neighbors who suffer real damage, flooded basements, cracked foundations, things like that? What financial responsibility does the developer have both in the short term during construction and in the long term over a period of years? Because sometimes issues don't appear because for the flooding. Issues don't always appear or right when you expect them to appear. What is the developer's short-term and long-term financial obligations? Um, if I could just ask Mr. Haverty quickly, is that a, a question that can be answered in this format or is that something that somebody really needs to discuss independently with the council? Uh, well, I, I mean, I can answer it generally, which is to say that they would have liability if you are able to establish uh, that any damages were a direct result of um, aspects of the construction uh, that were not done properly, um, that were inconsistent with the plans, or somehow caused the damage to the personal property. I, I would say that, in particular, the further down the road you go, the more difficult drawing that line of causation would be. Ms. Brown, does that address your question? Sorry, yes. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Haverty. Um, so the last name I have with a hand raised is uh, Ms. O'Driscoll, Anna O'Driscoll. You've had your hand up all evening and I have not been able to call on you. I'm going to have to assume that hand is raised in error. Um, with that, oh, Mr. Rarig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a couple of comments on the, the draft decision. Sorry, I have to ask you for name and address. Uh, sorry, Brian Rarig, 28 Academy Street. Um, uh, first, one, one, one small point, which is uh, item 33 under the findings um, is the reference to the offer by the applicant to uh, uh, <clears throat> donate the land and some money. I, I'm not sure how that constitutes a finding. Um, it seems to me that that is um, a bit of the record, but um, there's nothing about it that is a finding. What, what would be a finding? Um, I think would be the board's um, determinations of the the value of the conservation land being uh, uh, being preserved, and uh, uh, what would also be a finding would be some data about the condition of the land um, and the uh, you know this the unfortunate condition of the land at present. Um, a bigger issue, though, and I, I want to thank a couple of members of the board for, for raising this. Um, I, it, I think it's important that these findings include um, a much more extensive description of what makes this site so unique, um, which is the, the condition of the wetlands, the condition of the dumping, the general conditions of, of flooding that take place around the um, around the parcel, and it, it's important to uh, to have that um, be part of the findings in order to uh, for anyone who re re reviews this record to understand how you got where you got. Um, but I would urge the board not to leave the drafting of those items in the hands of the applicant, but rather to turn to the Conservation Commission and perhaps to Beta as the the board's uh, peer reviewer um, to draft those sections that I, I think are so critical. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to address the board? Um, I'll quickly flip through the images of other people, see if anyone is waving frantically at the screen, which I do not see. Um, one last call to um, Ms. O'Driscoll. Okay, with that, I'm going to call the public comment period closed. Um, so that'll conclude the public comment period for this portion of this evening's hearing. Um, so there were um, a number of people who had specific comments um, on this, which we, is very helpful. We do appreciate it. Um, all those comments, if you can email them to the board's the email address, which is zba at town.arlington.ma.us, um, that's extremely helpful for us to be able to incorporate. Um, so with that, um, and seeing as it is 1042, we're not, I don't intend to start a new topic at this Excuse time. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Mills. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to get one factual question in and get a, re a meaningful response. Several Please. members of the public have tried to get answered. What is the elevation of the basement relative to Dorothy Road? And I would like a specific question answered uh, ASAP. What will be the basement floor level relative to the elevation of Dorothy Road as it currently is? I keep getting the question answered by relative to uh, terrain, but terrain is too movable. I want to know what the basement floor is relative to Dorothy, how far below it is. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Hessen? Do you have the, Mr. Uh, Hessen, do you have uh, that Mr. or Chair. does the architect have that? I, I can answer that question, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I do want to point out that the information has been provided in all the uh, site plan drawings and architectural drawings, but as we discussed earlier, the, the uh, abutter's question about the height of the building, the elevation of Dorothy Road is approximately elevation 10. The elevation of the garage floor is elevation 2.83. So that means that the garage is seven point, my math is right, one seven feet below Dorothy Road. Thank you very much, sir. So that's Thank approximately you. seven foot two, something like that. Yeah, approximately yes. seven foot two inches. And just for reference, um, Mr. Asher, what what is the 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 water table height in the area? Elevation three. Okay. Mr. Chair, Steve Revelak. Mr. Revelak, yep. So I have a just um, this re procedural question relating to the project eligibility letter and um, this one of the earlier comment public comments uh, brought this to mind. In the event that the uh, the f I forget it's if it's the funding agency or DHCD decide were to determine that the project was not. Uh, no longer eligible under the new design. What would be potential? What are the potential next steps? Yeah, it's a question for Mr. Haverty. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it really would depend on the nature of the determination by the subsidizing agency. I think they could, if I think it's unlikely, but if they made the determination that the change was so substantial that it completely invalidates the determinant of project eligibility. Theoretically, they could um, essentially invalidate that determination and require the applicant to start from scratch. Um, I, I don't think that there's a strong likelihood of that occurring though. Generally, what, what a subsidizing agency will do when there is a change 
during the course of the process before the Board of Appeals is to simply state that they are going to look at the changes as part of their final approval process. Um, the board will request that they actually make a determination prior to the final approval process. I think that's going to be in what gets submitted to the subsidizing agency. Um, but in terms of the ultimate result of their determination, it, it's it's more likely to be just a revised um, determination of project eligibility than it would be a, a rescission of the letter of project eligibility. Thank you very much, Mr. Haverty. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. Just a, if I could address a, just a follow up to Mr. Haverty. Um, am I right? Would it be fair to say that the determination of project of project eligibility and whether or not the changes have affected substantially or were invalidated the previous finding is entirely up to the funding agency, isn't it? It, it is not something that we independently have any jurisdiction to look at and we're bound by whatever they decide. That is correct. And there's no appeal right of the determination of the subsidizing agency either. Okay. There is, there's a presumption in the regulations um, that the determination by the subsidizing agency is a valid determination. Okay, with that, um... I would like to close, uh, not to close, excuse me, to continue tonight's hearing until Tuesday, March 30th at 7.30 p.m. Um, may I have a second? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Is there yes. any possibility of our starting a little early that night? Um, There'll be, the, we'll, we've got lots mm -hmm. left to do and I'm concerned mm -hmm. that, that starting at 7.30 will all fall asleep before we manage to get to the end. <laughs> Mr. Havity, is earlier a possibility for you? Absolutely, yep, that works for me. Ms. Kiefer, is it earlier possible? That's fine for me. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, do you have a time you'd like to propose? Is 6.30 a sensible time? Or seven? Uh, I see some thumbs up around the room. So then, um, I would move to continue tonight's hearing until Tuesday, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. Second. Thank you. And there's a quick roll call of the board on this. Um, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Ms. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont? I know he has switched to being on phone, so I don't know if he's, I hope we seem to have lost. <clears throat> All right. That is still a positive vote. So we are continued until Tuesday, March 30th at 6.30 PM. Um, so thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout this meeting. I especially wish to thank um, Rick Ballarelli and Vincent Lee for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And it's our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI TV within the coming days. And if, again, if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA's website. Um, to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I move, Mr. Second. Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All board members voting in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for your attendance and attention this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Good night, everybody. Thank you, John.